I thought you were just saying ship as like a cute Christian way to curse. Yeah, no, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Christian cousin. <laughs> Hey everybody, Buddy Basil here. You are listening to the Joy Spiracy Theory, and I am so happy you're back. I want to say a big, warm Joy Spiracy Theory welcome to all the new listeners. If this is your first episode, welcome. I hope you enjoy. And back, back over to you, veteran listeners. You guys, you guys are the best, and you guys are all going to love this episode. We have an awesome conversation with a listener named Cherie. That's right, but more about that in a second. I want to say thank you to all the Patreon supporters. You Patreon supporters, keep an eye out because there's another Ask Baz episode coming your way. And if anybody out there says, what is Ask Baz? That sounds like the worst possible name for a podcast. Well, it's another little bonus podcast that happens over on Patreon.com slash The Joy Spiracy Theory where you can get all sorts of fun rewards, bonus episodes, as well as Ask Baz. I I have, they're getting ready to post one uh, pretty soon after this. So go on, get over there. And if you have questions, send them my way, baby. I want to say thank you to the iTunes people who left ratings and reviews. You guys are the best. You are single-handedly tricking the iTunes robots into recommending this show to unsuspecting listeners. That's right. Imagine that. Robots actually recommending a show of mine. It's uh, That's some real uh, divine irony there. Okay, moving on. So thank you for everybody who's done that. And if you have not uh, left a rating or review on your podcatcher, please go do that. Whether it's iTunes or Stitcher or whatever, go ahead and leave a rating and review. Let people know what's up. But I get it. You want, you want to get into this episode before you leave a rating and review. So let's do that right now. We've got this awesome conversation with Cherie. You're going to hear just a, a, a library of fascinating stories and, and ones that uh, just really reflect the, uh, just all the, I didn't even know how to explain it. Guys, you're going to love it. This is the this is the real deal. We're going to be talking about waking up in this world and what that means for ourselves, but not just that, but for the ones we love. Well, those poor, poor people we love. What happens when we when we wake up to what's going on, as well as uh, just actually also what it means to be a follower of Jesus in this day and age, and uh, really going and doing some of the things that we often don't do that Jesus asked. Let's just go on. Let's get into it. Hello, Basil. Hello, Cherie. How are you? <laughs> I am literally doing really well. Oh, don't you start with me. <laughs> don't you start right off the bat with me. I was laughing me. so hard, and, my, and I've got it in my headset, so my husband's like, what is so funny? I'm like, Ed, should it take too long <laughs> to explain? <laughs> uh, for those who are not on the same page it is uh canary cry news talk read some articles apparently uh reporters nowadays are lighting liking to use the word literally literally oh. every possible chance they get but this isn't about them this is about you now i sure your name's sheree right i'm saying that correctly yes okay yes you have it right okay the other option was cherry which uh <laughs> would be, be unique but um, I'm glad I got it right the first time. It would be incorrect, but you yeah. got it right the first time. Yeah, <laughs> Unique it was great. Yet incorrect. Um, <laughs> so before we get too far into this, Cherie, tell me what you're grateful for, girl. Okay, I thought about this a lot. Mm. Uh, he's going to ask me the first thing. What I mean, and I kept thinking, I'm grateful for so many things, like mm. you know, my kids, my pets, my my husband, my job, everything. But I, I, I narrowed it down to, I am grateful to have a sober husband hey. and a reunited marriage. Yeah. yeah. So I am very grateful. Mm -hmm. That's a great one. That's awesome. Yeah. And you know, I know that there's people out there that not a lot <laughs> of talk goes around of things like this, but there are certainly um, families who feel the same way. 
and that's uh, that can be a big struggle. That that's I mean that's a life altering uh, adjustment. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And that, and I work I work at a women's treatment facility. Oh. Um and so I I care for uh recovering addicts every day. Yeah. You know, and I get to know families and I I understand the struggles of their families. I understand I I understand to some degree the struggles of the girls. Yeah. Um just my experience with my husband, but um I love my job. I love it. I love getting to work with my girls and you know, their babies, my babies, I call them my babies. So. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. Well, that sounds like you're doing a lot of good work and I'm sure there's a story that got you there. So we can kind of start out tell where are you from, where are you at right now? Well, I'm in Gainesville, Georgia right now, but I am from Denver. I was born in Tulsa, uh, but in 1984, my dad moved us all to Denver to start uh, the Denver Street School. So, Whoa. okay, okay. Yeah, so, so, born in Tulsa, so mm-hmm. you, and then to Denver. So, there's a little bit of a trend here. Okay, looking good. So, first of all, how long were you in Tulsa for? Until I was five. Until you're five. Okay, so I not... remember. I remember it very vividly. Oh. But uh, yeah, I was only five when we moved. My mom was pregnant. I was almost six. I was so angry with my dad. I did not understand, and I had a little boyfriend named Aaron, and <laughs> <laughs> I cried and cried. And I remember one night, um, I was in Denver when we first got there. I was sitting at the screen door at our apartment and my dad, you know, in the middle of the night and I was crying and my dad came and got me and he's like, you know, what's wrong? And I miss Aaron so much. So yeah, <laughs> I wasn't too pleased at the time, uh, but now young love. Oh yes. Very, yes. We're, we're good very, friends now. very young love. <laughs> we were going to get married when we were three <laughs> years old. We knew we were going to get married, but no, we're friends now. He's, I think he's, I don't think he's married yet, but I know he's in, he was engaged to someone, um, real beautiful girl. He's got, he's got some beautiful children. Um, but yeah, we've, we've, we lost touch for a while and then we, we, uh, reconnected a few years ago and he's just a great guy doing really well. He's got an amazing testimony. Oh, that's very um, impressive. So, Keep in touch yeah. with uh, somebody you knew at three or five or whatever. Yep. That's, I don't know if, well, I have one person who I still know from back then, but we've been a- around each other the entire time. There was no reconnection. Right. I have completely forgot <laughs> and lost everybody from that part of my life. So congratulations yeah. on uh, yeah. getting that one all settled. Yep. And it sounds like he's doing great. Okay, so you're so we jumped uh, ahead a few years, but you, first of all, your father moved your family. That's your mommy, your daddy. You got any brothers and sisters? Yeah, my sister was uh, three at the time, or two and a half. I can't remember. She's two and a half years younger than me. So okay. I was five. Uh, my mom was pregnant with my little brother, Ricky. And uh, it was a very um, difficult pregnancy because she had um, miscarriage, miscarried about a month before she got pregnant with my brother. Mm, yeah. And so it was very, he was actually born a month early. It was an emergency C-section. So, um, yeah, so that was, that was great. But uh, that wasn't great. <laughs> the C-section <laughs> well, he, wasn't great. <laughs> he made it out. That's the important part. Well, yeah, and the the awesome thing about that was, and I remember it very, very well. My my um, my mom had gone in for her eight month ultrasound on January fourteenth, and he was supposed to be born on uh, Valentine's Day. Mm-hmm. And my dad and me, and we used to drive uh, our one of the ladies that te- taught at the school that he worked at. We would drive her home every day, but we had to stop at the hospital and pick up my mom. And during the ultrasound, um, the, my mom noticed, my mom was a nurse. So she kind of, she was familiar with sort of everything that was going on. She was a, a, she was a, what is it called? Not nursery, but whatever the, the, um, where the babies are. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Baby zone. Maternity I think is what it's yeah. She was a maternity nurse. So she, so she knew what was going on. She said that the, the nurse's face looked 
uh, scared and she wouldn't say anything. She got the doctor. The doctor came back, you know, looked at the ultrasound and my brother's heart had stopped beating. Mm. And um, so she, they rushed her into emergency C-section. It was just amazing because my dad and I just got there at that moment. They dressed my dad out. I... I thought he was dressed in paper towels. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it was like, you know, those emergency scrubs. Yeah. And um, they they pulled him out. They got his heart started, and they my dad they handed him to my dad, and and uh, he came back. My the lady that we used to take home, we were sitting in the waiting room, and he came back, and he said, "It's a boy," and it was it was very exciting. It was very exciting. Very exciting. How how old yeah. were you at the time? You I was six. Five or six, mm-hmm. yeah, okay. I was okay. six years old, yeah. Very exciting um, for a six-year-old. Yeah, yeah, yep, it was. It was. I was excited. It was a little different with, with Ricky because um, was, I have another brother who was born when I was 10, and so I was very, very close with him. You know, I took care of him a lot. My mom had some um, emotional difficulties at the time, so as a 10-year-old, I took care of you know my siblings, especially my baby brother. Um, But with Ricky, he was so fragile that we, you know, we weren't allowed to hold him for a while. So it was a little bit, it was a little bit different experience between Ricky and Neil. So Mm. still love them both dearly. And my (laughs) sister, she's, I just love my siblings. We're a very, very close family. So that's great. So the whole family got moved over to Denver for Uh something that had a very interesting name. And I want to know. Streets. Yeah, Denver Street School. Okay. So in in 1979, my dad um, visited Denver with my mom um, and me. Obviously, I was a, I was a baby, but um, my dad's cousin and her husband had a ministry in downtown Denver. I think it was called the Genesis Center at the time, and it was really geared for the homeless, um, just helping to take in the homeless and minister to them. And my dad, who's an educator, he was a principal at, at a high school in uh, in uh, eastern Oklahoma. He saw the correlation between poverty and a lack of a uh, high school diploma. Mm-hmm. And it was he ever since that trip for that five years in between that trip and us moving, he could not get it out of his head. And he started he, he started having this vision for he just kept thinking the street school, uh, the Denver street school. And um, I think it was soon after that trip that um, he he was not feeling well, and he found out that he had um, an, like a l- undiagnosed strep, mm. which had gone on for so long that it um, it corroded his uh, aortic valve. Oh my gosh! So I didn't even go, know that that could happen. Yeah, strep is no joke. My dad, if we if we think we have strep, he's like, get to the hospital because yeah, no kidding. It killed it killed my great uncle. Um, back right before penicillin, um, was discovered, my great uncle, uh, died at seven years old really? uh, because, it, yeah, because it turned into a rheumatic fever. So, yeah, so that's what my dad had it. My mom, you know, my mom and dad were very young. They were in their early twenties. They had a 18 month old baby. He had to go in for, um, open heart surgery to have a, a valve replaced. And, um, my mom, of course, was a mess. And my dad, he said that when he was being wheeled back to surgery, he was praying. And he said, Lord, if I survive this surgery, I will I will move to Denver and I will start the street school. And so he did. He survived. And so, you know, it was a couple of years before we could go. But he kept, he had it on his heart. He had this vision. We, we visited Denver another time. And, yeah, in, in uh, 1984, he just, I believe it was 84. It could have been 85. He's probably going to correct me when he hears this. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, he, he put us all in a U-Haul. We went to Denver. He got a job at um, a Christian, a small Christian school where, you know, I attended kindergarten. And he taught because he, he was a math teacher and a history teacher. My dad knows everything about every piece of history in the, in the universe forever. Awesome. So, Very yeah. impressive. <laughs> Can't talk to him for five minutes without learning everything there is to know. So, uh, yeah, so he taught at this school, and we were going to um, – my uncle Frank is was at the time a real big, well-known pastor in the Baptist church world. Um, and so he had a church. He was the pastor of this church in um, 
Southwest Denver. And so we were going there because my cousins went there too. And he would always be talking about the street school. And there was someone there he met and said, hey, you, you still want to do this street school thing? And he said, yeah. And he said, well, I've got a property in downtown Denver right off of Colfax and Ogden, which if you're familiar with Denver, that's like the worst neighborhood in all of Denver. It's it's where everything goes down. But that's where my dad's heart was. And that's, that's where um, uh, at the same time, my cousin and, his, and her husband started a church there called well, it was a it was a coffee house. They started a coffee house called Jesus on Main Street. Fine. And this guy owned um, the house next door, and he said, I- "I'll rent you out this dining room." And so, yeah, in uh, I think it was either August or January of 1985. I believe it was 1985. Um, he just scooped three homeless people off the street. They didn't have a high school diploma, and they wanted one, and. Um, my dad got some old books, old Abeka. I know you went to Christian school, so I think you're probably familiar <laughs> with Abeka books. <laughs> oh yeah. Abeka and Bob Jones. Yeah. Uh-huh. yeah Bob Jones later, but he just got some old books and he just started teaching. And that, that, um, May, June, he, the, the first three graduates of the street school, uh, graduated with their high school diplomas. Wow. And that was 30 something years ago. And today, um, there are he, he, about 50 schools across the country because he started the street school network in 1996. Um, and because so many people kept coming to him because he was so successful, you know, with, it was, uh, not, when I'd say to success, I don't mean money. I mean, changing lives. Sure. Yeah. I can't imagine that there's much of a profit margin on teaching students for free. Yeah. Teaching homeless kids. (laughs) Yeah. 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 No profit. I remember one time my mom telling me back in that she's, we were reminiscing about that. She said, yeah, you know, our expenses were 900 a month and our income was 600. (laughs) And so, (laughs) but you know what, Basil, God always provided. And I've had, I've always had a faith, even through my, you know, up and down years, never lost that faith. And I remember when I was six, my mom, my mom really liked this tea. We always got our food from food banks. We, I don't even remember going to the grocery store, but sure. And so I, I really wanted strawberry shortcake cereal. And my, I, my, I remember my mom used to have this one tea that she could drink while she was pregnant. You know, she really liked it. And, you know, I saw a commercial. This was back in the mid-80s, you know, and strawberry shortcake was huge at the yeah. time. And they had this cereal. And I said, Mom, let's pray. Let's just pray. God God will provide. And so she's, you know, just sort of, <laughs> you know, just indulging her six-year-old. And so we prayed. And um, that day, my dad came home with a food box from the food bank with two boxes of strawberry shortcake cereal and two boxes of the tea that my mom liked. Hallelujah. I know. I said, see, mom, God answers prayers. (laughs) (laughs) And it's been that way my whole life. It's always been that way. So I've never, I've never really doubted his provision you've had moments in your life where you're like oh dear how are we going to get through this but at that same time i i always remember god is he always will provide yeah yeah amen well that's awesome you know it's being in those situations that really show the provision of the lord and yeah you know my mother uh prayed plenty of you know Prayers with this to to soothe the six year old that ended up coming true and is very impressive. <laughs> very very yeah. fun time. That so, is very mm-hmm. so that's pretty awesome. I mean, uh, you know, you gotta say your dad going over there starting that school. Awesome, awesome ministry. Awesome thing for you know the community and and lifting people up out of their situations there. That's beautiful, especially when it the price of that is basically poverty yourselves. Now, right. uh, you know, how did mama feel about this? How was, what was the kind of family dynamic at home like that? My mom was very supportive. Um, my mom, uh, and uh, probably not at first, she really struggled um, 
just it was difficult you know she she struggled with the with being around the homeless people it's not easy yeah. for you know if you've never been around it it's not easy to be around homeless people um you know and addicts and stuff it's a very different experience than if you were raised in a small town and you go to a church for the you know your whole life and everybody's got you know, middle class or whatever. And so, yeah, it was very hard. Um, but God really worked on my mom and she, she began, she began to have a heart for them too. Um, and she, they would go, they'd be asked to speak at different churches all over the place, both in town and out of town. We, we traveled everywhere and my mom would sing. My mom is a songwriter. Um, and so sometimes she would sing that song, people need the Lord, which is a great song. And so then she was inspired one day to, to write this song. Um, I love this song. It's called Who Will Love Them? And gosh, every time I hear it, I just I just love it. I, I would love to sing it and, and just share it with the world at some point someday, whenever I can find the actual <laughs> track. Yeah. She did record some tracks back in the early 90s, but, you know, they're all in tape and they're probably corroded. But it's called Who Will Love Them? Is it, it the... the um, what do you call the chorus is who will love them, who will take out of their time and who will love them. Their lives could be yours or mine. And who will care if they go to eternity, who will love them? It seems like the father is asking me. And I just love it when she sings that. Cause you're just so moved and convicted. Like these are people, these are human beings. They are God's children. Yeah. Who is going to love them if it's not you? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like we are every day, we are all faced with a decision of being loving or not. That's you know? absolutely and, true. Uh, yeah. So I really, my parents, I mean, I had a pretty bad rebellion in high school in my early 20s, but that was always instilled in my heart this compassion and deep love for people. You know, and so I'm, I'm really grateful for that because. It, they <laughs> they endured a lot. That was not an easy time. Yeah. We did not have money and there was we, we took in a lot of we took in a lot of homeless people, a lot of unwed mothers. We always had people living with us. Always. Mm. So um yeah, yeah, you know, that's that's a that's a hard thing. I've I've done some I well, I continue to do some work with similar uh, people in similar situations and you know, it's uh, it's true. There's a reason why more people don't do it, but especially Christians, it seems like, you know, it's funny you say that because I was just scrolling through Facebook and I don't know who this person is, just somebody who friended me. I don't know if this is, if they listen to this show or if they're on, on some other stream or something. Um, but somebody posted... Show me in the Bible where it says to take care of the needy. And it's oh, like, gosh. right? And it was like, <laughs> what? Oh, what gosh. are you talking about? And there was surprisingly less responses than I would have expected. I was like, oh, this dude's asking for it. And, oh my gosh! And it seems <gasps> a lot of people didn't have actual verses to point to. They were just like. Oh, it's common sense or, oh, it's what Jesus did. So we do it. And <laughs> I mean, a simple Google search brings up just tons and tons of explicit instructions to like yeah. basically drop everything you're doing and specifically and exclusively help the poor. <laughs> Exactly. I would say find a, a passage or a sermon when he did not tell us to yeah, love totally yeah. totally I don't think this one, you and know, in so. an extreme way too not in just sort of an, an alms giving way which is also great and super helps and nobody should not give alms in fact more people should give alms but in like a straight up like the way your father did which was basically submit yourself to like the yeah. the submit yourself to lack and and divine <laughs> Uh, you know, care while helping others. It doesn't say like wait till you have millions and then help others, which yeah, is kind right. of 
which is kind of I, and you know I'm I'm specifically talking to the American church I'm sure it's all over the place and not all American churches but I would say the general s- mixture of American capitalism and Christianity the answer is kind of like okay yeah maybe I'll I'll do a soup kitchen now and then which is great not putting it down right. but right. it's either that or well I'm just going to keep working and pray to God and make my millions. And when I do, I'll set all the homeless people up with nice tents or something. Oh, oh, kitty. Oh, ow. Oh, ow. Gosh, you know not to use the claws. You know not to use the claws. I don't mean to laugh, but I've got three cats here, so I don't know how you feel. (laughs) Oh, that was brutal. The, The other... Puncture wounds were just healing too. Um, yeah, so you know it's it's, and you know I'm here. I'm not blaming anybody. I'm the same way. I certainly could be spending more time and energy and making more sacrifices to help out. I I do my best, but you know it seems to be one of those things. I think Christianity mixed with American capitalism, um, it it ha- it's one of those things, one of those combinations that has a lot of potential. Um, you know, there's a lot of talk about, you know, yeah, socialism or government programs helping out the poor, um, or, you know, the, the, the opposition to that is, well, it should be churches and individuals who are helping out the poor. And it's true. I mean, I I think one statistic says $20 billion could end homelessness, homelessness in America, whether that's true or not, I'm not sure, but $20 billion, I mean, we could come up with that. Like, well, yeah, it's I mean, a crazy you know, how big the defense budget is, yeah. you know, like if we're starting a space force. I yeah. mean, seriously, <laughs> I mean, we just yeah, we just upgraded the 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 budget to 700 billion, which, you know, I'm not against, you know, making a strong military. However, just make it 680, make it 680 yeah. billion and then use a few billion to end homelessness. Okay, but that's not what it's about. This isn't a conversation about governments <laughs> fixing our problems. This is also, you know, I mean, if somebody took the time and the energy or we all got on the same page, yep. the individuals could also collect $20 billion and and fix homelessness, even, even if we don't have to do it in like a centralized way because then that opens it up to – you know, bureau- bureaucracy. Yeah, bureaucracy yeah. and greed and, and all sorts of stuff like that. But, I mean, it's just like if we all decided together we were going to end homelessness and we all just, like, teamed up and, you know, chose a few people to help out, mm-hmm. then it could be fixed. But And so the the ability in American capitalism is there. I'm, so I'm all for it. It's just the fact that people got to get on board, man. People got to yeah. get on board. And, you know, there's obviously situations, which I'm sure you've experienced, where people just kind of enjoy is kind of an offensive way to put it. But they, yeah, they're they freedom, freedom loving people. <laughs> I've certainly met a couple of them. But yeah. but more than anything, what you know, what is needed and what I, I observed my parents and my, they're actually my aunt and uh, my cousins, but I call them aunt and uncle. The thing that I observed in them is not so much money. It's time. Uh, yeah, totally. It's, you invest time in people. And my, my dad has this quote and I can't wait to tell it to you because it's my favorite quote. I've seen my dad speak thousands of times. I've heard the, sp- I've heard the speech thousands of times. And I, every time I still love listening to it Mm. because it's so powerful. And this is how I conduct my life with my girls. He says the, the, um, the only way to reach the lost and broken, um, people in this world is through the sacrificial intervention by loving Christian adults to the point of extreme inconvenience. Mm. Yeah. It's not, and he says, it's if you're if you're working nine to three as a teacher, or you're you know doing something inside your job hours, that is not extreme inconvenience. It's, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't still do that. It means that these people are lost and broken. 
They're broken down people. Mm. And, you know, throwing, you know, activities or throwing money or, you know, throwing boxes of food or handouts or, you know, stuff like that. That's great, but that won't fix it. What they need, first of all, is to know God's love. Right. They must know God's love because without God's love, I don't know how people navigate through their life without knowing how much God loves them. I just don't, I don't know. Cause even in my darkest, darkest hours, I know God loves me Yes, and we have to, we have to invest our time, the love, because it's the Bible says that, you know, we love them because he first loved us, you know, and while we were still sinning, he died for us, you know, and no greater love that, you know, that a brother has than he would give his life. And so, you know, it's like, it's almost like we think there's this two extremes of just throwing money and then dying for somebody, but there's so much in between, you know what I mean? Right. But we don't do give that time because it's inconvenient. We want our free time. We want time with our families. We want vacation time. We want this extra time. And if people really looked at how they spend their time, I'm including myself, there's a lot of extra. Yeah. And you know what? There's a lot of people who need that time. Yeah. You know? Well, it's fun. I mean, I was going to say I got I get very passionate about it, but and I do my best to 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 participate in programs and give time and do all those sorts of things and and but still, I mean, still I got free time. I spend my time sitting in a chair talking into a microphone. <laughs> <laughs> but Basil, you are, you have to understand that you are you are doing that. You are acting out that love. You, I know that people have said this before, but I'll say it again. You have no idea how many people you've reached and how deeply you've reached people through what you and Gons do. I no mean, way. it is. I'm serious. You. When I found y'all, oh, okay, I'm not from South. I, I say y'all all the time. My daughter hates it. <laughs> when I found you guys, um, uh, you know, I was in the in the middle of my searching, and um, you know, it was so good. It was just so good. And then it was so great to hear from, you know, a Christian perspective. But then uh, a couple of months ago, and I, this is why I wanted to write you guys an email. I was going to put an email. I was going to write you and Gons and Josh Peck an email, just mm, CC you all, and just fun. tell you how you. Oh, I don't even know how to explain this. <laughs> so my my my, I have to be careful. Um, you know, my husband and I. Um, my husband is a recovering addict, mm -hmm. and we divorced in 2012, and we remarried in 2016. And we went through some really dark times a few months ago. I was already awake, quote unquote. Mm -hmm. um, and, and my awakeness really affected my marriage. Mm. And it pushed my husband to a, a, a dark place that he has been to before, that we've both been to before. And um, it was very hard. And I felt broken and done. You know, I just said, I, I don't know what else I can do. Yeah. And of course, I, I listened to YouTube videos all day long in my spare time. And I, I was doing a Canary Cry Radio binge, <laughs> like just everything on YouTube. I didn't know about podcasts yet. I literally just <laughs> learned what a podcast was. So I'm on Welcome YouTube. Welcome to the, the future. <laughs> I went all the way back, as far back as I could, into the first video that you guys put out. And I just listened and listened and listened. And right at that dark time, it was when you had Josh Peck on for the first time. And well, it wasn't at the time that you had him on. I, that's the one I listened to at that time. Yeah, sure. Ago. And, oh, my gosh, he is so funny. And the, the um, oh, what's the word? The interaction between you guys. <laughs> <laughs> just, it put so much joy in my heart and it just, the three of you together, I mean, I, it sounds so silly because the stuff that you guys were talking about was so like, just <laughs> <certain and desolate. laughs> pretty intense. Yeah. Just silly things, you know, and like, what did he call you? Like little boy or something like that. Just <laughs> the funniest stuff. And it really, really helped me. It really did. It got the joy back in my heart. And I'll tell you, our marriage has been, I'm not going to say, you and Josh Peck and Gons have healed my marriage. We did it. We thing. did it, everybody. 
it brought me back to a place of joy and hope, um, especially with Josh Peck's. Um, I keep using his whole name like he's a you know superstar. Oh, we but... all do. <laughs> well, you know, he was a Nickelodeon. Right? Yeah, that's true. <laughs> he was a Nickelodeon star. <laughs> but yeah, it, it, his testimony of his addictions really, you know, it touched my heart too. Mm, and mm-hmm. and and of course, other videos, you know, just really as I kept watching or you know, listening to, there's really no watching except for the live streams where you just have that. <laughs> my cool mask. Yes. That silly, silly mask. which is so funny. But, <laughs> oh gosh. It brought so much joy into my heart and it really helped me to, um, change my attitude. Oh my gosh. I can't even tell you like how, how much God has changed me. And that's something I tell my girls, you know, when they're struggling with someone else, I tell this to, you know, anybody I meet, a lot of people talk to me about what's going on in their lives and they ask me for advice and stuff like that. And what I tell them is when you are in a relationship and a person is hurting you, you know, and I'm not talking about physical abuse. I'm talking about, you know, other kinds, emotional and just the struggles that you have in any relationship. Yeah, totally. We are so prone to, and I still do it. Sometimes I catch myself. We pray that God will change them. Mm, mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And something I learned from, I, I read, um, power of a praying wife. Uh, we had been married for two years and, he he left me. He he came to Georgia, and I was in Denver with my our son, and I was living with my parents. And I was desperate, absolutely desperate, for my marriage to be healed. I, I've always been in love with my husband, and um, but he, you know he was really struggling with drug addiction, and I I was struggling with so much anger because I I even though I grew up in a church where. Most of the people there were drug addicts and homeless people. I still didn't understand addiction. Right. I didn't get it because I, I wasn't just an observer. I was in the middle of it. And I was so angry that he wouldn't just stop, just stop, you know? Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, we were separated for about three months. And I found um, my my best friend, um, Kim, and I went through the same thing at the same time. Her husband left her at the same, the, literally like within two days of each other. Oh, wow. And we, we just reconnected. We had not spoken since we were 17 years old. We had a fight when we were 17. And we reconnected at my cousin's um, uh, baby shower or birthday party or something like that. I can't remember what it was. And um, we were both hurting. And we just, we just totally reconnected. It was like we were 12 years old again. I moved into her house for a couple of weeks while her husband was gone. Um, my son was two and she had three children. They're like around my son. They're, the youngest was about a, uh, a year younger than my son and their old, their middle one was a year older. So they all got along really well. <clears throat> and she had that book at her house. And um, at that time, and things are different now, but at that time she was not interested in healed marriage. She yeah, just was totally. so angry. Old. And I was not filled with anger at that time. I was desperate to have my marriage healed. And I found that book and I read it. And the very first thing she talks about is stop praying that God will change him. Mm. Start praying that God will change you. And that really stuck with me. You know, like, who are we to tell God what to do with another human? Yeah, you totally. know, that's, that's his job. That's his child. And even though you love them very much and you think that you know what's best, and obviously being a drug addict is not what's best, God knows that journey. And he's in charge and he's in control. And we have to let go of control over our spouse or our children or our parents or or whatever and start asking the Lord to change our hearts. Because when when our hearts are changed, even though we may think, well, I'm right, and I'm being loving, blah, 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 you know, we're, we're not, you know, and we have a lot of room for change. God can really, really change a person if you are willing. It's about opening up your heart, submitting to him and saying, Lord, I hand it over my husband to you. And in the meantime, I want you to change me, change me, whatever it is that I do that is incorrect or sinful or wrong or hurtful 
work on that with me. So Show good. me what that is. Search, you know, and it, it did. I mean, obviously I'm still a work in progress, but I can tell you I am not the same person that I was at that time. Yeah. But, um, that's anyway. so good. You know, I was that. no, that's, that's fantastic. And you know, it's, it's so interesting because Praying for a change in ourself seems like such an obvious thing. I mean, that should be the first place that our our minds go in 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 any need. I mean, um, you know, it's it's hard to find a specific need that couldn't be helped by the Lord doing in a work doing a work in us. I mean, even financial needs or. Uh, you know, whatever it is, there's always something that the Lord can do within us to, to, you know, equip us to handle the problem or at least to, um, you know, partake in whatever God's got a plan for. And, um, but, you know, you yeah, might... I'm just step aside, just saying, just be, just when you, we pray for God to change us to, you know, in our financial situation, whatever it is, sometimes it's just about us put laying it down at the foot of the cross as we're told and not grabbing it back right laying it there letting go of it and stepping aside because we have this idea that we're supposed to do everything and it, I'm not saying we shouldn't work and do our jobs and pay our bills and stuff I'm saying he has told us time and time again that he is our father and he will care for us you know, he says, consider the lilies. They they don't toil. They don't work. They don't worry about what they're going to eat or drink or whatever. You know, you just they just are. Yeah. And he loves us so much more, you know, than that. He says, do not worry about what you eat or drink or what you wear because your body is so much more than food. You know, your life is more than your clothes. But we have this idea that we are, you know, we are solely responsible for that. And if we can't come up with some way of, making the ends meet, then, you know, you know, we don't even think beyond that. It's like, I have to, you know, and and so much wonderful stuff happens when you are in a struggle. I know people hate struggle because it's painful (laughs) in a struggle, especially financial or marital or, you know, as parents, when you're at that end and you cannot connect those two ends, you cannot fix it. When you lay that down and literally let it go completely, you submit it and you, you, every time it comes into your mind, like, I love your episode on worry. Mm. I love it because that's exactly what I do. I tell my husband, I tell my girls, take, as soon as the thought pops in your head that you're the thing you're worried about that you can't fix, you, you take it captive, you grab it and you throw it out and then you pray. I already gave that to you, Lord. I already gave it. And then and immediately do something else. Just yeah. do something else. Yeah. Amen. Because he can do so much more than we think he can. It's You will find amazing things if you let go. You really will. Yeah. Amen. Amen. So true. Now, you mentioned something earlier that I'm, I'm curious about, and I'm curious um, mostly because I, I think it's something that's relevant to a lot of people who are in this place. And you mentioned when you were waking up that yeah. that was causing some issues. That in, Was it that in particular or what? like what's it the deal? It totally was. Oh, oh no. My, gosh. my husband literally, literally. Don't. <laughs> <laughs> He said I needed to go to therapy. He wanted me to go to a psychologist because I was like, I was, you know, when you're waking up and you're just like, oh my goodness, <laughs> what? 9-11 was an inside job? What? <laughs> Bush is not good? McCain is evil? You know, like there's the elite and the Illuminati and all this. The Nef- I mean, you just, one thing after the other and your brain is like, firing and you want so badly to talk to somebody about it. Yeah. But you find that as soon as you open your mouth, your husband is telling you you need to get therapy. <laughs> yeah, well that's that's what's so interesting. I mean, 
it, it, that's, it scares me a little bit to hear that because, you know, I know for a fact that these types of things can kind of drive a wedge between people. And, you know, I don't, you know, there's a part of me that wants to make sure that I'm not responsible for driving wedges between people. Exactly. But it yeah. got, I mean, of course, I mean, there's people in my life who just kind of smile and nod and say, <laughs> you're a crazy person, but I love you. But, um, yeah. But, you know, it's, I mean, it, you must have been really something else, though. I mean, if you don't, if you don't mind, oh. you must have been really a piece of work at that time. Oh, my goodness. I, I, it was, it was like several months of uncovering and uncovering and wanting so bad to talk to people about it. And the kids were just like, I remember, I'll tell you about who Lynn is in a little bit, but uh, <laughs> I was talking about something about the Quintons or, like I found something out. I was listening to some YouTube and I turned around and said, guess what just happened? And, you know, they're all looking at me. And then as soon as I said, Clinton, I saw eyes rolling. <laughs> <laughs> Literally, I'm not kidding you, ran away. And just Lynn ran down the stairs. Savannah was like, whatever, mom. She <laughs> Chris was like, I got to go. And I felt so lonely. Yeah. I felt so lonely. And and over time, you know, I prayed about it a lot because it was driving a wedge between me and my husband. And it was part of the um, um, catalyst for the dark time. And <clears throat> and so I realized, you know, I have to temper this. And I, my husband and I had a really good talk about it towards the end of, this, of the darkness. And, you know, it was over. I was overwhelming him. And I was, I was also um, uh, making him lonely mm. because I, I was just constantly consuming information. And it was alienating and no, him. Yeah, I had no interest whatsoever to be watching, you know, these TV shows or movies that ah, once you know the symbolism, your brain, you can't, yeah, like, you can't even watch anything anymore. You can't watch a movie. You can't enjoy anything. Because you're just like, oh my gosh, there's black and white checkers, oh, pyramid, you know, <laughs> Baphomet, you know, like you're just like seeing it everywhere, and so you can't enjoy it. And I, so I didn't enjoy sitting with him and watching whatever. And he, of course, did not enjoy watching what I was watching. And so we realized that I had to first of all, I had to temper my ex excitement. I had to temper it down. Um, and he agreed to, you know, listen you know, agreed to just sort of a compromise. Um, and we both, we both agreed to cut down the, uh, away from each other time. And it's still hard because of our work schedules, but we definitely, um, intentionally carve out time together. So we're still, we're still working on that, but yeah, it had a very drastic effect on, my life and my relationships, you know, my, I tried to talk to my sister about it and she's like, yeah, I'm okay with conspiracy theories. And I, I said some, and it was like, you, you know, you met, met with the, with the same old stuff. I mean, I was, we were driving back from Denver international airport. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> Cause I went out to visit her cause I'm from Denver and I saw the, you know, the demon horse and of course coming out of the airport, I see all of the murals and the, demonic satanic horrible stuff uh, uh, that i never once noticed and i have been in that airport uh at least once a year since i was 16 years old and so i never noticed it i just thought that's really interesting art okay and now i now i see it and so we're driving back from the airport and i i started to say something and i said never mind you, you probably don't want to hear it and she goes no i like conspiracy theories and so I started and, you know, and then I was met with the kind of, you know, let me express this because my sister will probably hear this, <laughs> Becca, I love you. Okay. And I realized that we don't see eye to eye on some things and you love me so much and that's okay. We can agree to disagree, but I felt squashed, mm -hmm. you know? And yeah. so once again, that loneliness sort of hit and, and she felt lonely too, because like, I, we wanted to spend time together. But I was really tired. Yeah. And um, I was still in that consuming information phase. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. yeah I, I you know, 
but and, and it is difficult and and you're this that's something that a lot of people experience and i'm very lucky because the second i started waking up is the second i started a podcast and had no need to talk about it with anyone <laughs> Oh my gosh, you're so lucky. <laughs> I know I, the horrible things that would have happened in my life if I hadn't started this podcast. Um, I love it. The and people I'm so I would have the, <laughs> the people I would have alienated and the people who and me be alienating myself and and uh, you yeah. know, especially around the people I was around at the time. And not to say that I never shared it with people. I just I had the the luxury of being choosy about when to bring it up because it yeah. wasn't, it wasn't, you know, I had a release valve. So yeah, you had someone to talk to about it right. and, a, and, and a, like a, a platform and stuff. So you could just get it out. Cause that's the thing is you, you find out all this stuff and you just want to share it. You want to get it out. Right. Then you find nobody wants to hear you. They're just, they, you know, as much as my husband will listen to me, he, he does listen Uh and he does believe a lot of the stuff. Kind and patient man. He's a wonderful, wonderful man. I love that man so much. But, um, but a lot of the time he, we've talked about it. He's just like, sometimes I just want to go to bed, hun. And you just talk and talk and talk and talk and talk. (laughs) I'm like, I'm sorry. I don't have any friends. (laughs) (laughs) I have to get it out. So yeah. yeah, 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 totally. Well, that's well, that's very interesting. I mean, I I got if I'm gonna be completely honest with you, which I feel like I can. I mean, that Always. is that is one of the more extreme <laughs> versions of the story mm-hmm. that I feel everybody kind of lives through. Um, mm-hmm. You know, when they start waking up about this type of thing. And, um, you know, because like I mentioned, there is that sort of pressure that builds up and you got to let it out. And what you do kind of end up doing, much like, you know, a boiler building up steam, is you just spray everybody around you with steam and they're getting burned (laughs) and they want to run away, you know? Yeah. And so, and so, yeah. Well, the reason why I, you know, it started, my husband and I have always been good friends and, you know, we, we talk all the time. I, I, feel like I can tell him anything. Yeah. And so at the very beginning of all this, like a year and a half ago, it was now it's been a while. I, when I first, like I told you in my email, uh, it all started with aliens uh-huh. yeah. and I was, I love documentaries. So I, was, I always like to watch historical documentaries and I started noticing they were talking about, you know, ancient visitors. And I was like, well, that's weird. Yeah. And so I started researching um, aliens. And it was like, Oh my gosh, the evidence is overwhelming. Mm. And then I was like, huh. And then I remember, this is so weird. Like I remember I, I found watchers something, I don't know, one or two and Chris Putnam was on there and Ellie Marzulli was talking about aliens. And then Chris Putman, Putman got on there and he said that they were demonic. And I remember at that time I was mad and I didn't want to hear that. I wanted to believe that they were aliens because mm. my whole life, I know you've been raised in Christian schools, your whole life, you're told aliens are demons. They're just, you know, distracting people from, from the message of Christ. Yeah. And so that's always what I thought. But then when I started seeing all this evidence, my, I wanted it to be aliens. And I remember being mad and turning it off. Yeah. But then I saw, I watched serious, um, by uh what's his name dr greer and i was totally convinced it's aliens and so i started researching his stuff some more and i watched his session of summoning i started listening to he was taught teaching about summoning these entities and i i I watched his video when he's on the beach with these people and two orange orbs show up and immediately that Christian upbringing, that the, the scriptures that I've, I've memorized my entire life came rushing to my mind. And I turned it off and I said, okay, this, this could be something bad. <clears throat> and I, you know, I wanted to see what everybody was seeing. I wanted to have an experience. I wanted to see a UFO or whatever. But I'd also, I did not want to invite something demonic yeah. And so I sat down and I prayed. I wrote out a prayer to the Lord. I said, Lord, I want to know the truth. 
whatever it is, I want to know it. If there's aliens, I want to know it. If, if it's demons, I want to know it. Just show me what it is. I said, I don't, I don't want to summon something. Because that word, that's just like a you know, red flag trigger word. You're like, uh -uh. <laughs> right, right. I'm summoning nothing. No way, you know. And immediately, my, I know it sounds stupid. It's probably an algorithm or whatever. But my um, YouTube feed just started popping up with, uh, you know, um, the alien demon thing. and The, the algos got you. Yeah got me and i i said uh, the that evidence was overwhelming and i watched what's his i think his name is jim jacobs or jay jacob uh he used to be a new ager and uh, with the um <clears throat> mufon <clears throat> and then he became a christian and then he went back and talked to his buddies at mufon and they were you know they revealed to him that there's like hundreds of cases of people calling on the, the name of jesus and these these uh, experiences end yeah. that's what that's what got me and I said, all right, thank you. I just thank the Lord because that's that I knew that was the truth. And during that time, I'm Chris and I are my husband's Chris. We are going on walks, we're walking the dog, and I'm sharing what I'm watching. I said, Oh my gosh, honey, I watched this documentary, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, What? You know, <laughs> you know, he just had kind of taken it in. So I always felt comfortable telling him, but then it started to get overwhelming because once that started, once I got to that place, it's just a snowball. It's just you you start you know re, you know start listening more to L. A. Marzulli, and then uh, oh gosh Chuck Missler, so much Chuck Missler. Yeah, yeah. And then you know, and then I find Canary Cry Radio, and and then it's just this snowball of. You know, then I find a documentary on the Illuminati and the elite and the Satanism, and it just gets bigger and bigger. And, you know, you're just overwhelmed with my whole life has been a lie. Yeah. Everything is a lie, except for what I know to be the truth. One thing that didn't change, but actually shed light on even more, is that. This word of God is the truth, and it is the only thing that I can trust. That's it. There's nothing else. And so, yeah, I'm just sharing all this with Chris. And my husband's a fairly new Christian. I guess it's been a few years, but, um, you know, he wasn't raised in the church. And so he, you know, he wasn't raised in a Christian school, in you know, Bible class every day, you know, and you have to memorize verses and all this you know, chapel on Wednesdays and stuff, which I, I love that I got that experience. And so... Uh, that really gave me that foundation, but sharing that with my husband, it just confused him. And, uh, you know, it just, yeah, around Christmas time is when it, it got, that's when, <laughs> that's when he's like, I think you need to see a psychologist. I'm like, no. Yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> it's, it's, at some point, you know, we probably all could have helped, been helped <laughs> by some, uh, by some therapy, yeah. <laughs> at least for nothing yeah. else. The fact that, uh, you know, you paid that person some money, so they're forced to that's, listen to you for an hour. That's true. I never thought of it that way. <laughs> you know? I just, you know, I just started to temper it down and just kind of choose what I shared. And I knew he didn't want to hear certain things. And so I just didn't. I just kept to myself. And that's kind of where the the snowball happened. But, th you know, things are, are really great right now. But now I'm in the um, in the phase of memorizing as much of the details as I can and finding out more and telling my girls. Like I don't, I don't go into crazy conspiracy theories with my girls. Not, I don't talk to them about some of the really, really hard stuff, but I do, you know, sort of challenge them with the truth. I've got one girl that she loves conspiracy theories. So if I find something out, like, like the other day I said, <clears throat> Oh my goodness guess what I just found out about the Clintons. <laughs> said, oh, what is it? And I said, this girl had evidence about, you know, I don't want to go into it because it's sure. awful yeah, and horrible. Yeah. And then she died. And I said, she's the latest in the string. You know, we've got 200 confirmed Clinton deaths, you know. Yeah, for <laughs> sure. That's she's just so, the latest in the string. Well, so. yeah. Well, that's so, I mean, that's so interesting that you're able to at least discuss it with your with your child. You know, not a lot of people oh, have that. Not my child. I gotta I have to clear that up. You're, when you I said, said your girl, girls, you mean your I, 
your I mean, the girls, are... like, the ladies that I take care of. Got it. Got it. Okay. I always do. People always think I'm talking about my kids. I'm like, no, I have to clarify. <laughs> my monkey, my daughter is my monkey. Okay. And my girls are the ladies that I take care of. And now the... we know. We know <laughs> the secret code words. That's how you so know. So confusing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that's how I got the nickname Mama Cherie. Uh, is from my girls. I, they, we were at Target one day, and I had gone outside, and they were looking for me. And they <laughs> went to the lady and said, "Can you page? Can you page our mom?" <laughs> <laughs> like three grown women paging Mama Cherie, and I was like, "I'm right here." That's <laughs> so <laughs> funny. Mom. That but is I, so you know, funny. you do take like a mom role. You're like a house mom there. So yeah. That's yeah, for sure. My girls. Yeah. Oh, well, that's so. very, that's very cool. Yes. Okay. I get it. Your girls. I keep forgetting that uh, you, you do <laughs> kind of have replay that role. Um, yeah. Well, that's very interesting. Now I am cu- a little curious. I mean, the conversation when you guys, you guys split up for a little while and then getting back together, you know, you, you just couldn't stay away from each other and you just decided you were going to lay off oh. the crazy talk, huh? Well, no. I mean, yes and no. Um, So my husband was in the Army for almost seven years. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I was an Army wife, and he was deployed twice to Afghanistan. And, um, you know, when when he joined, he was sober, totally sober. He had stopped using. He was – it's a long story about why, but he um, he just felt like the Lord was telling him to join the military, he needed to provide for our family. We were struggling financially. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, he was doing really well. And during the second deployment, though, the guys, a lot of the guys had started getting hooked on uh, K2 or Spice, the synthetic marijuana. Oh, interesting. Uh, yeah. And so his, he, he Is that, you know, that. So that stuff's real? Oh, Gosh, yes. It, uh, it, that stuff destroyed my marriage. Oh, my gosh. Okay. I, so that I that wasn't related. It. He didn't start using because you were a crazy no. person. This was no, no, separately no, no. related. Okay. okay. No, my husband, my husband was a recovering addict. My husband was an addict, you know, when we met and mm-hmm. married. And I didn't really understand that until we, because we separated for three months and he came back and we got counseling. We were doing really well. We had our second child and... And, you know, I sort of understand, you know, what addiction is and, and things like that. But um, he got sober. He joined the military. He, you know, went on the second deployment. It's war is not pretty, not fun and not pretty and not good. It's horrible. Yeah. It's horrible on marriages. It's the, it is the most difficult thing next to losing a child. I think that having your husband deployed is the next most difficult thing to get through in a marriage. I mean, the divorce rate is so high, so high in the military. Yeah. And, you know, we were, the first deployment came with its own issues that I don't really want to air. Um, and, and we, you know, oh gosh, that was a hard one to come back from, mm-hmm. but we both got counseling and we just decided, you know, we're going to stay together. Yeah. And so that, that year between was real good. Um, and, I thought that the de- the deployment for me, the second deployment for me was the best year of my life because I found my calling. That's when God put this love of women, not a, an agape love for women. Yeah, sure. <laughs> I hated women before. I, there was such a huge oh, jealousy issue. I did not want to have anything to do with girlfriends or nothing. No, because... There were issues. There were, I think you know what I'm saying. Yeah. yeah. You sure. know what I mean? Like I, I, it was too hard for me to handle. I was always jealous, always suspicious. And so I didn't want to, I didn't want to talk to any women. All women were competition. Yeah. And, um, during that, uh, the year between deployments, God really started working on my heart because, you know, there, of, of, of the first deployment problems. Um, and that's when I really pulled out that power of a praying wife that changed me, changed me, changed me because I can't, I can't change him. I love him and I choose to stay, but I can't change him. I need you to change me and my perspective. And he did. He did. I remember waking up one morning and I just kept, 
the book of Hosea was on my head. I don't think I've ever read Hosea before. I was going to say, I think most people haven't. So that's very fascinating. I didn't even know it's a book of the Bible. And I woke up, I could not get out of my head. I was like, Lord, are you serious? I mean, I literally, I know you hate that word, but I <laughs> did literally say that out loud. Are you serious? <laughs> I was tired, you know, so, but I got up and I got myself a cup of coffee and I went outside and I read that book. And that is that was my decision point as far as those issues go. And I said, okay, I'm staying. I lo- I'm going to love my husband. I'm going to honor my commitment to my, to my God. That yeah. was more important. That's awesome. Um, but right after the, the second deployment, the, the um, spice had just got out of control. And um, it was just all the old stuff coming back up again. It was, it was the disappearing and the lying and the hiding and the finding things and, I, I got to a point where I was like, you you got to get a handle on this. He had just gotten accepted into um, special operations, the 160th uh, special operations at Fort Campbell. Yeah. And um, he was supposed to start, he was supposed to go to, you know, you go to school for that. It was supposed to start like September 5th. And on July 11th, um, he disappeared for a few hours, couldn't find him. His texts and phone calls were really weird. My son, who was 11 at the time, um, was freaked out like he he was old enough to realize something is wrong he he talked to his dad the day before he said he was going to be home at a certain time but anyway he comes home at like quarter to midnight and I can tell he's on something I don't know what it is I know what he looks like and sounds like on on any substance because I've experienced before I know I I can identify he's he's been drinking or he's been smoking pot or whatever yeah this I recognize I had known about the spice so I knew what he was like on spice this wasn't spice and oh something was wrong and he spent the whole night apologizing and the next night um we you know when you're in the military you you develop such deep bonds with other wives. It just, I mean, they always talk about war brothers and stuff, but we are, we are, you become strong sisters when you are an army wife, because that's all you have Yeah. when your husbands are gone. And Fort Campbell, that second deployment, we had five brigades that were deployed. There was like zero men on the base. <laughs> there was no equipment. There was no gunfire in the background because we, you know, there's a range there, which was very comforting to hear that. There was no uh, helicopters, nothing. And so it's very lonely. So you, you, you are forced to build these relationships, which is wonderful. Cause I'm still friends with all these ladies. But anyway, that night, um, we were going to a dinner to say goodbye to one of our girls. She was PCSing or retiring or something. Her husband was, and he was, um, watching our kids and my, my best friend who was my neighbor, her kids too. And I came home. I had a great time. I remember it vividly. I came home And we wanted to have family time, you know, just to kind of, you know, heal from the day before and everything that was going on. And we were sitting in our room with our kids on our bed. We're watching a movie or something. And I keep seeing him reach over to the side of the bed. And I just knew something was wrong. And so I went to the bathroom. In my bathroom, which was in my bedroom, I see my, one of my credit cards had powder on it. And then I see a pen, uh, without the pen, you know. Right, the, right. Just the tube. Yes. And I just went, Oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. So I came out and I, I said, Where is it? And he's like, I don't know what you're talking about. I grabbed his bag, I searched his bag, nothing. And then I noticed underneath the nightstand I saw three little jars, little tiny jars, like the size of Carmex jars, maybe a little bit bigger, of white powder and it says bath salt on it. Oh and no. One of them was open and I just went, I didn't, I mean, that's okay. I have a hard time controlling my emotions. Whoa. I have, I do have a diagnosis of emotion regulation disorder. So very hard for me to say, okay, my children are in the room. You need to put them to bed and quietly deal with this. I did not do that. Oh, I no. was so at the end of it, you know, and I made a lot of mistakes and I, I will own up to all of them. Yeah. Um, that night, of course I, I made a lot of mistakes, but what it is, what it is. Um, I grabbed them and I, you know, started saying, what is this? And I'm yelling and the kids are just 
My son took my daughter and put her in a room and said, do not come out of your room. My son went to his room and we're, I'm yelling, I'm like, what is this? And come to find out, you know, it was like, <laughs> he was saying that he was going to sell them, but he was snorting it. And yeah. that's what he had been on the day before. He had been, it's like synthetic, um, meth and bunches of stuff it's just chemicals yeah i mean that's the real stuff that was a, that was a hot topic a little while ago it was horrible it yeah. was horrible and i i said you will choose us or you will choose these these jars it went on for about three hours you know i we i he was going back and forth he didn't want to give it up and you know it's 11 o'clock at night i've got my two kids i i can't you know my i should have in retrospect I should have taken them over and woke up my, my neighbor and asked her to watch them, but I didn't do that. I was not thinking. You're really not thinking at those moments. Mm. You, you're, not, you're not processing, especially me. I have a difficult time of processing and ma making good choices and whatever. So I said, you know, we're going to the barracks because in, in, the, in the military, if there's any domestic dispute, the soldier has to stay in the barracks for 72 hours. It's just required. Oh, interesting. No matter what the dispute is and so i took him down there as i knew he was hanging out with these these you know people that were doing that and i packed my kids in the car and i packed him like to get your stuff let's go and i drove him to the barracks and i said you will choose us or you will choose that and my kid i'm crying my kids are in the back seat crying and begging daddy please choose us please choose us and he grabs those three jars and he gets out of the car and he starts walking to the barracks. Wow. And we are just sitting there bawling our eyes out. My little, my, my seven year old and my 10 year old, my son was almost 11. I, we were just a mess, an absolute mess. It was horrible. But then he comes back to the car and he says, just let me sell them. Let me sell them. And I said, are you kidding me? You are their sergeant. You are their, you're their, you know, leader. Yeah. And I am a leader of a Bible study that I have to run tomorrow morning. And I'm on the worship team. You want me to, in front of my children as a worship team leader and a Bible study group leader to say, it's okay for you, the leader of these men to go sell this drug. I said, that's ludicrous. Wow. No, do that. And eventually he got back in the car and we went home and I sent the kids to bed. I just said, you've got to, Joseph grabbed Savannah and, and you know, he, he's such a protective brother and he, he took her up there and, you know, distracted her. And I'm downstairs and we had a bathroom downstairs. I said, if you want to stay here, you'll throw these out. You will dump these down the toilet. I'm not doing this anymore. I'm not going to put my kids through this anymore. You know, my kids were little and the first, when it first started happening. And so, you know, I can protect them a little bit, but now they're big and, and, and now this is serious stuff and you're bringing it in my house, you know, and these, these, um, drug dealers know where we live and I don't know who they are. I said, this is, has to stop. And so we're in the bathroom and he gets two of the jar. It took about half an hour for each jar for it to convince him to, to dump it out. And he is high as a kite. This is happening. And he, he says to me, you don't understand it's so euphoric. It's just like amazing. I said, I don't care. Mm. I said, dump it out or we are done. I'm not going to put my kids through this. And he got to the third jar that was, had already been opened. That's the one he had been using before. And he goes to dump it out, pretends. And then at the last second, he tosses it back into his mouth. And I, I noticed it and I, I, Right at the same time, I knocked it out with my hands because that much bath salt, that would have killed him. Right. Had he got that whole jar in there, he would be dead. Wow. So he got in and I threw it against the wall. I said, get out. We are finished. And, and I, have, I have threatened divorce so many times in our marriage. We've had a really, really rough marriage. And I, I have my own anger issues, of course. Um, but at that moment, it was, that was it. I, I, I had decided, you know, I had, my life was different. I was confident. I was, I knew who I was. I knew that I could, I could survive without him. So I, I had a lot of insecurity issues, a lot of confidence issues, you know, before and during that marriage, um, believing that, you know, I, I could not live without him. I could not live without a man. And, 
during that second deployment, God really strengthened me, you know, showed me who I am and who I am in him and whose I am. And um, I said, get out. And, you know, I let him use my bike. Um, I wouldn't let him take the car. I locked all the doors. I called my mom and my dad and I told him and I had not cried except for in the parking lot. The rest of the night I was just, you know, pumped up and angry really. And I broke down. I just said, it's over. And I knew in that moment it was over. I, I knew that it wasn't a temporary thing. I knew that I, I had to divorce him because every single time he was using or, or relapsed, you know, I yell, but I let him back in. He has a safety net. He knows yeah. all he has to do is just endure some yelling and then everything's okay. Yeah. And I started learning. I have to take this safety net away. He has to hit rock bottom. I can't, I, I love him so much as all. I cannot even express how deeply in love I am with my husband and, and always was. And that was the hardest decision I ever made. And, um, it's a lot of rest of the story is real long. It's just, you know, he, then he came by the next day. He was supposed to be on CQ duty the next day, which is 24 hour duty. You have to sit at headquarters and, and just sit there. You know, if you ever go into a military base at any brigade or any battalion headquarters, there's two, two soldiers sitting there. They're always there for 24 hours. You get 24 hours on. And then the next day you get off 24 hours. Wow. So he was scheduled to do that. He comes over. He <laughs> He called me. I said, I can't find my cell phone. I said, Chris, you are calling me from your cell phone. <laughs> <laughs> I'm back out. He says, I need my uh, whatever cover or something. He needed part of his uniform or his ID or something like that. So I let him in to get that. And he said, please drive me to headquarters. I said, sure. I, I was so upset and angry, but I, I drove him and I was begging him just to go to the ER. Cause I could tell he, he was higher than a kite. A, kite was not even higher high enough to describe how high he was <laughs> he gets out of the car and he okay i don't know if you know anything about army uniforms but <clears throat> it's extremely important to have everything in order you will get in so much trouble if you're missing anything or anything's off he's sitting there he's got no cover which is that beret he's got no shirt underneath his um B uh, acu blouse which is that you know digital you know green yeah, and whatever thingy jacket yeah. you're you have to wear a tan or a green shirt underneath it he's got no shirt underneath it he's wearing white loafers and white socks <laughs> you have to have boots on and you gotta tuck those suckers in your boots I was just like, you look ridiculous. <laughs> and he's like, I got to go. And so I went home and I'm calling my chaplain. My chaplain and his wife and I were really good friends. And I'm crying. They know what's going on. And and he's like, he said, if you can just get him to go to the ER and enroll in ASAP, which is Army Substance Abuse Program, mm. it will be okay. Because if you do that, you, you're guaranteed not to be demoted. If you go to them and say, I have a drug problem they won't demote you. They will get you into rehab and, you know, you'll have to do that. But, you know, a lot of guys, there's a stigma attached to it, so they don't want to do it. Yeah. <clears throat> and so um, I said, I, he's not going to go. He's, he's at headquarters right now. His captain's going to see him. He's going to get, you know, chewed out. He's going to get chaptered or he's going to get an article or whatever. And so anyway, I get home and he calls me and he says, he's, he says, I need you to bring my cover or something, boots, whatever he was missing. He was missing a lot of stuff. So my son begged to go with me. So I brought my son, and um, we we went and got him, brought him home to get whatever it was he needed. And on the way back, he's, you know, I'm begging him, please. And I told him what Army ASAP was. I said, please, please, please. And Joseph, my son, is begging him too, just please. And, um, oh, I, I skipped a part. When I had come up to get him um, to go back to the house, <laughs> bath salts make you hallucinate and he was hallucinating big time he was seeing oh, demon no. hands yeah he's walking through battalion headquarters basil in white <laughs> loafers <laughs> <laughs> and in between the two battalions there's this glass glass doors on either side and this big you know, foyer that you can go straight through and he is going back and forth like 
like looking out like he's looking for the enemy, you know. So he's like, you know, like real tense and like, oh, you know, he goes back to the other other window and you're looking. And I was like, you look ridiculous. He's, you have to go to the ER. He's, Something's wrong. He's, <laughs> he's trying to go to work and meanwhile he's dodging <laughs> demon hands back and forth. He was. It was so scary. It was so scary. He finally agreed to go oh because he gosh. knew as soon as his captain came in and saw him, he would be toast. So we drove him to the ER, and that doctor said, you, you, you don't understand how many deaths we've had from bath salt. And he is, like, sitting there. Oh, my gosh. It was so funny if it wasn't so horrible. You and know? he He's says, excuse me, Mr. Demon Hand, I'm here to see the doctor. He's sitting in the bed in his <laughs> hospital thing, and he's, like, constantly looking around, like, like on alert, like he's seeing things and I'm trying to talk to him and the doctor and he is just like looking back and forth and swiping away these hands that aren't there. Oh my gosh, that's a my nightmare. Gosh. Oh, it was horrible. It oh, was horrible. No. And of course it was mixed in with, you know, K2 and stuff too. I don't know if he had smoked it that night or if it was, you know, before or whatever, but he was just out of it. He doesn't remember any of this. Wow. He remembers nothing. I mean, so that's, he that's probably luxury. for the best. There might be yeah. some residual <laughs> nightmares if you can remember any of that. Well, the, the, the luxury of it is he doesn't remember how horrible it was for me and my kids. Mm. He does not remember the screaming and crying and the begging. So when we talk about it, it's not a memory for him. Yeah. It's like a story. And, but it's very real to me and the kids. We we all remember it vividly. It was a horrible, horrible, horrible two day period. It was awful. And my chaplain's wife and my chaplain came in. They brought my kids to see him to say goodbye because you know once he's in the Army ASAP program, they're going to take him to a rehab facility um, down the road. That that's where the, the soldiers go to. And so it's a it's a long detox. It's ten day detox and then like a thirty five day rehab. And so the kids came in to say goodbye, and Joseph said goodbye, and Savannah, who is still little, she is on the bed saying goodbye, and he's eating an apple, because he hadn't eaten in days, and so he's eating an apple, but he's still looking back and forth, and still seeing these demons. And my daughter is trying to say goodbye to him, and she looks so terrified. And all of a sudden, he rears back with this half-eaten apple. He's got this intense look on his face. He's looking off into nothing. There's nothing there. And my daughter is sitting on his lap, and she is terrified. And he rears back to throw this apple. I grab his hand and say, stop. I grab my daughter. I give, him to my ch- give her to my chaplain's wife. Um, and she, I said, just please take them home. Oh, my gosh. And I just, it was horrible. It was the worst day of my life. I went home, and... They, his, um, staff sergeants pick him up, um, because they're, they're his transport. So they transport him back to the house to grab his things, to pack a bag. And, um, but then it, it fell on me to take him. And so I, I ended up taking him up to this rehab and, um, I, we checked him in. He was very scared. He was still very high, still hallucinating and got him in. I'm sitting down with the, uh, program director and, um, I find out that it's a co-ed rehab, Mm. which could be fine for some people. Not fine. Not fine for me. I knew at that moment that that it wasn't, we weren't going to work out. It wasn't going to work out because I knew, I knew what was going to happen with other, with girls there. I just knew it. Right. And my husband loves me. I'll tell you this much. People believe that sex addicts don't love their wives or or if a man cheats on his wife, he doesn't love her. And I have struggled with that because it feels like you're not loved, but my husband does love me very, very, very much. He, he has a very tough battle to fight. And, um, it, it, it is a battle every day. And at that moment, you know, he, he was not, he didn't, you know, wasn't, there was no Jesus or God or anything in his life. Everything was get high and, you know, meet a girl. That's it. Yeah. When, when Chris is using, that's it. It's get high and get a girl. Yeah. And so when he said it was co-ed, I just, I, my heart sunk. So I knew it was, it wasn't going to work. And so I left him there and I cried the whole 45 minute drive home. And, um, God gave me this intense strength and discernment and wisdom. And, um, I still made lots of mistakes and said things I shouldn't have. And, 
you know, all that sort of thing. But what I did was I, I was going to school at Austin P state university. I found out they had family housing. I wasn't going to, I knew that we were, I was going to divorce him. Uh, and so I couldn't stay on, I didn't want to stay in our, ba- we had a beautiful house on post. I mean, just brand new. We were the first people to live there. It was gorgeous. And I, I've never loved a home so much, but I, I knew that we were going to divorce. I couldn't stay there. And I needed to get my kids out of there. Not that where, where we went was great because it was horrible, but uh, it was hard for me to be in the house. And so um, God just started providing one thing after the other. I had no income whatsoever. I had his income, but I, I wanted so badly to not be blamed for anything. I didn't touch a dime of his money, except when my son turned 11, I took out some money for his birthday party and that's it. Yeah. I didn't use any of his income, um, anything in our checking account to pay any bills for myself. I, I found this housing um, at the campus. One of my good friends from church, she said, um, hey, do you need help with the deposit? I said, oh my gosh, yeah, that's the, the thing I've been praying about. And she goes, here, here's 600 bucks. Whoa, there yeah. you go. Yep. And then, uh, you know, over the next few months, people started, uh, anonymous people, people that I probably knew, but that, you know, didn't tell me. Uh, my chaplain's wife knew who they were, but I, I never found out who they were. Paid my rent, paid my utilities, paid my bills, sent me cash, sent me money. Um, and so I survived. I got a job. I got on um, food stamps, I, you know, all that sort of thing. In that state, you have to be working. I was at school. I had enough. I didn't have enough hours at school to make up. They really sort of try to promote getting back on your feet. So you have to have a job or be looking for a job. So I found a job at a bar (laughs) across the street from campus. This is the most notorious bar in all of Clarksville. And it is campus. You mean across from the, the base? No, from the school. There is a college. Yeah. University in that town. It's down the street from the base. And I, I'm living on campus and there's a bar across the street. And I see my, I needed a job that could, you know, um, yeah, what's the word I'm looking for? Accommodate my hours because I had to go to school and I had kids. And so they needed an overnight, they needed a third shift, um, bartender and waitress. I've never bartended in my life. I ever, I've never made one mixed drink in my entire life. Luckily, they didn't serve any mixed drinks. It was all beer or in a can or a bottle. And so I was in luck. I didn't have to learn how to make anything. And oh my goodness, God used that experience for so many people. I, I was very bold. I am very bold with my faith. I brought my Bible in every time. I was known as the bartender with the Bible. The Bible bartender, drink. baby. That's right. I didn't <laughs> drink. I didn't smoke. I brought my Bible. And I tell you what, I still am friends with several of the people who at that bar, reconnecting with Jesus Christ, made a decision that day to never drink again. Wow. That's bad for yeah. business. Super bad for business. I, <laughs> it didn't matter. I made no money there. I made no money there because I'm a third shift. I make two fifty an hour as a wait, as a bartender, waitress, or whatever. Yeah. And you know, of course, because you're supposed to make the tips. But dude, you have to cut off the alcohol right as I get there, and you can't turn it on until you know three hours before I gotta go. So I only have a three hour window where people are actually drinking alcohol. Oh, wow. I am in, in this window where there's only people who are still drunk who can't leave yet and are sleeping or you know, whatever. <laughs> and then uh, overnight and then a few hours of nothing. And then raucous early morning alcoholics who come in at six, you know? So I made no money. I mean, uh, that's where God, he, he shows up. You know, if you are, if you are faithful and you submit yourself to him, and I'm not saying I was perfect because I made a lot of mistakes. We all make mistakes, you know, as a mom, as a, as a wife, as a friend, as a whatever. But my heart, I was always submissive to him. Lord, use me anywhere you want. And Lord, I know you're going to provide. I know we will have food. I know we'll have our rent paid. I know it. And he did every single day. My kids were safe somehow. You know, we lived in this teeny tiny cinder block apartment that was 
stinky and old and but we had free cable so hey, that was there cool. you go free internet <laughs> um <clears throat> yeah um we had to get um foster uh animal foster parents for our dog and my cat because mm. i just i couldn't part with them i i still have sammy was the one that was just in here i've had her since the um second deployment yeah, it sounded and, uh, like she was a little worried when we first started the conversation yeah. She heard she heard something in the garage. It wasn't us. It was she. Uh, she's I don't know what it was. She almost never comes down here, and she came up with her ears up. Maybe it was you. And she's like, "Hey, <laughs> Wait, that's that, Basil Rose. That Basil, say hi, say hi, say, t- say hi for me. That's Monty's daddy. Say hi to Monty <laughs> for me. And I don't know, but anyway, yeah, we we've had her for a long time. She's an old gal, but that was a very hard, hard time in our life. But God really, really provided. How and, long um, ago was that? That was in um, the end of 2011 and uh, January of 2012. Mm, wow. And our divorce was final on January 30th of 2012. And um, he got sober for a little while and he started, you know, coming over and helping with the kids. And we really tried to work things out. I, I like I said, I was always in love with him. Um, but he just kept. I kept catching him in lies. And I just said, I just can't, I can't do this. Mm-hmm. You know, it, I really did not want to divorce him. I take, I take the scriptures very seriously. I take the Lord's word very seriously. And I know there's a caveat or whatever. I know there's that little excuse that we always use, but if, you know, in the case of sexual, whatever. Um, but I didn't feel right about it throughout the years. When people would tell me to to leave him, just you need just need to divorce him. I just never felt right about that. Um, the only reason that I divorced him, well, there's two reasons. Number one was I could not have that around my children. I had to protect my babies. Yeah. And number two, I knew that if I kept taking him back, because I did, I kept taking him back even after I, you know, started filing papers because I loved him so much. I knew that if I kept doing that. He was never going to get help. He was never going to hit the bottom, and he was never going to get help because he always knew that I'd be there. I had to not be there. And oh gosh, it was the hardest thing ever. It really was. It was. It was horrible, and it was horrible. And he sat there and he cried, you know, just saying, "I don't know how to do this without you. I just don't know how to." I said, "You're going to have to figure it out because I can't. I can't be." I can't protect you anymore. I can't, you know, do everything for you anymore. I can't cover for you anymore. You you have to reach out to the Lord and you've got to figure this out because I can't do it for you. Oh, it was really hard. Yeah. I, I mean, it sounds like it. That's a, um, sorry, I got this cat still on my lap. Oh, you're a clawing kitty cat. Me, clawing me to death <laughs> here. Um, I mean, that's, that's what, that's one of those things. I mean, especially, when you aren't necessarily at a point where you're just done with a person like that, you know, and oh, yeah. it sounds yeah. like, uh, you know, of course, as you've made uh, perfectly clear, you made plenty <laughs> of mistakes. Oh, lots. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, you know, I mean, that's, that's a, that's a big thing that a lot of women, as I'm sure in your, in your vocation, you realize that that's not something that a lot, that's not a decision that a lot of people are able to make. I mean, was that, okay. was that something, was that decision that you made because of uh, an experience or, or something like that? When did the, when did your work come into it where you started working with women like oh. this? And what, did you learn that from that? Or was that something you had to figure well, out that, on your own? This, this is years later. Um, you know, we've, we, um, so there's a big chunk of time in between that day and the day that we got back together. It took me uh, several months. Uh, the, the incident was July 12th. And uh, so I you were thought- so just to put this timeline together, you were waking up and rambling about no, 9-11 no. was an inside job? No, okay, not no, yet. No, this is totally separate. This, that, that, this the only, my waking up only happened in the last year and a half. We divorced back in 2000, it was January 2012. We got, got we married in 2016. So I, I started waking up around February, March of 17. That's when I started to wake up. 
Got it. Got it. Got None it. Of, I know okay. this stuff. Okay. I think I was a so, little mixed up on the timeline yeah. there. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. what I, that's what happens when I let the guests take control of the timeline. We no. get in some crazy time warps. Okay. Yes. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Now, okay. Now I'm understanding. Yeah. So all that happened, and Cherie, her pain and anger and everything, you know, came into play. And I, I made some, this is when, when my fall happened. I, I made some, but you know what? It was necessary. Not, and I'll get into it and you'll see why in a minute. But okay. so December, um, that, that Christmas, my, my, Husband's dad and stepmom came and got the kids and my husband for um, Christmas out there at their house in Knoxville. So I was by myself um, at, at my house. I was working so I could take all the shifts so all the girls could be with their families on Christmas and New Year's and all that. So I'm on, you know, I'm about to go to work in a couple hours on New Year's Eve. And for whatever reason, I don't even know, probably the devil, who knows, but um, the name of my one of my ex boyfriends from college pops into my head. I started thinking. I was like, "Huh, I wonder where he is. I wonder what he's doing." Of course, we have Facebook, so I'm like, "I have never ever thought about looking him up on Facebook," and so I did, and I I found him, and I was like, "Whoa, he looks so good," and he was holding. He was standing next to his dog, and I, I mean, that's oh, that's when darkness really started that's the drug stuff that i thought that that was the darkest hour but it wasn't mm. that wasn't my darkest hour um i i friend requested him and i i um heard back from him pretty pretty quickly and we started emailing and um i um we started talking all the time and he he was red pilled a long time ago and I just thought it was hilarious like I didn't believe nothing I didn't believe any of it I just thought he was crazy but he was so funny we he was like my intellectual equal like we just had this awesome back and forth you know what I mean it was just like these quick I, I can't even describe it it was just one of those things where you just uh, you could talk for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours and it's just awesome. And you're smiling the whole time. And I had been really hurt. I mean, I was hurt. I mean, I caught a woman in my house during the time when I had moved out and Chris had gotten out of rehab. He was staying at our house on post and I had brought the kids over and I went back in to go to the bathroom. And there was a woman hiding in my house. And uh. She ran out and my husband said, oh, you, he literally told my kids that I hallucinated her. I was really hurting. <laughs> what? Yeah, oh gosh, uh, the, the stuff that he's, I love that man so much, but he can make up some <laughs> stuff. Golly. But um, I was hurting. And, you know, at the same time that I was trusting the Lord, you know, for provision, and he, he did not let me down, I was, um, I guess I was not trusting him with my heart. And, um, you know, with my loneliness and with my pain and my insecurities. And I, I sought out, you know, comfort and, and love and, you know, affirmation and affection from someone else. And so I started this real, at that time, it was just a close friendship, but then it started developing into like, you know, feelings. And I was, I made the decision to move back out to Denver, um, because, um, just several reasons. And so, our relationship over the course of one month got really intense and, you know, we were, all, you know, we wouldn't say the love word, but we, you know, we would allude to it. And, you know, I grown distant from Chris, the papers had already been filed and, um, he fell in, Chris fell into a real deep depression about it and had gotten drunk and high and was driving her car, or some car and had gotten into an accident, got arrested with DUI and, yeah, and that was just it. And um, flew my kids out to my mother-in-law's house, and I packed up all my stuff, and you know, I talked to my sister and moved back to Denver. And um, how convenient is it that this man that I'm, you know, falling in love with is on my way to Denver in uh, in Oklahoma City? 
and so I, I go out and he, oh, showers me with so much affection. This date that he took me on, the, the day that I was there was more than I, I've, I just, oh, I've never experienced that kind of affection and awesomeness before. Like he, it was overwhelming. Now, now that I have been through this and I, I have my girls and I, I recognize when this happens, I can say, Hey, no, <laughs> that's not going to end well. <laughs> you can't, if the first day is filled with overwhelming flowers and candy and affection, and you haven't even got to know each other yet, that's not going to end well. It's just not. Uh, because what moving things moving a little too quickly there too fast. Just, and i was yeah. so hurt that i just soaked it all up yeah so i ended up um we we ended up uh, starting a dating relationship and um i was working for a congressman in denver i moved to denver and uh my dad of course has a lot of um political figures and you know oil and gas guys and whatever, lots of connections that are on his board of, um, for the school. And uh, a former congressman, you know, I had talked to him about my situation. He said I need a job. He hooked me up with the chief of staff for another congressman in Denver. So I started working as a receptionist there. Um, and in the meantime, you know, I'm, I'm having this, you know, very, very amazing fling with this guy. Now, it's not a fling. In my head, it wasn't a fling. It was serious. We were destined to be together. And, um, he, his parents lived in Arkansas and he was talking about maybe at first he was talking about moving to Denver, uh, to be with me. I was excited about that. And then he was talking about moving to Arkansas. And so I look up on the Walmart website cause it was in the town where Walmart is headquarters. And I find this job, um, as an, uh, legal assistant, a, a administrative assistant for the VP of legal operations and compliance for the U S and Puerto Rico. And, um, I applied for it and I, I, uh, got the job. And so I moved from Denver to Arkansas. Uh, my kids flew to, uh, they spent in the divorce papers. I let Chris have all the summers and all the, um, holidays, alternate, alternating holidays. And so, you know, that was in May or June. It was in June. I flew my kids out after school was done. I flew them out to Chris, um, who had at that time, by that time, had been um, discharged from the military. Um, lots of bad stuff there. But he was able to get it um, changed to a medical discharge due to PTSD, mm. which is, is good because it's true. I mean, it is true. My husband's been through a lot of trauma. Um I won't go into what happened to get him discharged because that's that's not my story to tell. But sure. anyway, um, he was in Gainesville here with my mother-in-law. And so my kids, I knew my kids were safe with my mother-in-law. She's a wonderful, wonderful woman. Um, I moved, so I moved to Arkansas. I started a whole new life in Arkansas. I got an apartment, beautiful apartment. And I had this great job making, you know, bundles of money. And um, th this... This new dude, he moves moves up there too. His parents are there. I guess know his family and move my kids up. But something was wrong, and um, I, I kept seeing red flags. Like the first night that I was there, or the second night I was there when I first stopped to see him. So the, we had the, um, this amazing date with five. It was a five part date with five stargazer lilies and five amazing experiences. It was it was awesome, but I, in retrospect, wish I had just run. But <laughs> <laughs> I was like, keep your stargazer lilies and leave me alone. It would have been best for both of us. But um, I, he snapped at me for something. I'd only been there for two days, and that two days was just filled with kisses and hugs and lovey things and all of a sudden he snaps at me for something and I was totally like taken aback like what and he he sat there and he looked really sad and I was like what is going on and he said you know you're gonna see it I said why don't you just apologize and he said because I'm gonna do it again mm, and wow. I just did not know I should have 
oh, I wish I had just run, but I didn't. I, you know, I was, I'm the kind of person that believes love conquers all, you know, love can heal everything. Right. I still believe that to some extent, but you know, I had anyway, so I started seeing those things. And while I was in Denver working and, and talking to him every day, I, I noticed his mood was up and down, up and down. And as, as his mood would change, my mood would change. So if he was angry one day when I would talk to him in the morning, all day I had a bad, sick feeling in my tummy. And then, you know, I'd talk to him later on, everything would be okay. And then, you know, the next morning everything's fine. And then that night he's drunk and saying all these weird things like, I'm, I'm going to hurt you. Like, just run now. You just don't even know who I am. Yeah, it sounds and like this dude is warning you the whole time, girl. All time whole time not just this dude who i have to say i'll, I'll get to it his ex-wife who's really good friends with his ex-wife she was also telling me not warning me to leave she loved him like she's like he is a wonderful man but he has this issue he has this diagnosis um and so the best way to love him is to just to research this diagnosis and figure out how to love him the correct way and so i i find out his diagnosis and um so I started researching, I started reading, it was borderline personality disorder mm -hmm. and some other things. And I start looking at the list of symptoms and I realize that I have seven out of nine oh, wow. of those symptoms. And in order to be um, diagnosed, I think you have to have five out of nine. And I realized at that, I didn't do anything about it at that time, but I, it was in the back of my head. I was like, oh, shoot. <laughs> Because I am emotional. I am, you know, I am irrational and I do make poor, you know, unwise decisions much less now than I did in my twenties. But, um, I recognize those things now and I'm able to control them a lot better. But, um, I started seeing that, but, but I, I kind of ignored it because I really wanted to believe that I could love him the right way and everything would be fine. And I could just push my issues to the side and be his strength and be strong and be loving and just change him with my love. And it was a disaster. It was an absolute disaster. And I, I remember in the middle of it, um, we had been married. We got married after about a year and a half of dating. We got married in April of 2013. <clears throat> And we bought a house together. And by um, September, I mean, this is between April and September, I had gone from, I was scared to marry him, but I loved him. And I didn't, I didn't want to call it off. I really wanted to believe we could make it work. But I was, I was so high on Clonopin the day that I married him. I just it popped so many. I was so scared. I was basically just floating down that aisle. Uh, I, I don't even, I couldn't even tell you why. People ask me all the time why, and I just, I don't know. I just don't know. I couldn't tell you. But by September, my I had emotionally I was so beaten down. You know, I I allowed uh, everything to just I literally believed that this world would be better without without me in it. And my kids would be better without me because I was a horrible person and that no nobody could love me. Um, and I was just listening to Christina Peck, your interview with Christina Peck, and she was um, describing that relationship. And I just was like, oh, my gosh, she's describing the same guy, you know, like mm. just, of course, he never did. He never drugged me or, or did things to me that, that Christina went through. But um, just the verbal and psychological um, stuff. Yeah. And. Now, I, I brought my own stuff to the table, but in September, I, I attempted suicide. Um, I went to a psychiatric facility, and I finally got the diagnosis of borderline. And it was the scariest thing I've ever done. I have been through some scary stuff, <laughs> but finding out about what borderline is was scary and relieving at the same time. Because if anybody knows what borderline is, if you, you, you don't want to tell anybody. Because if they know what it is, they're scared. If they don't know what it is, then you have to explain, and then they're scared. Because a borderline, many borderlines, people who have borderline, 
are up and down and and unpredictable. The moods are unpredictable. Mine is not as has not ever been as extreme as many of the cases, but I recognize a lot of the um, qualities, a lot of the behaviors, um, just a lot of mood swings and yelling and irrational thinking. And um, the problem is, and I found this out years later, that in a borderline brain, what happens is there's two issues. The, in the amygdala, where the fear center is on the, the fear side, Yeah. Um, in a person with borderline, a brain that is, oh, there's too much. There's more matter there. Mm, brain matter interesting. There. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then that's where, when something happens, when you have that fight or flight thing, when someone says something or you see something, it's activated. Well, in a borderline brain, in the limbic system, the other side, which is supposed to regulate the fear hub, is supposed to send these signals to say, no, this is not that bad of a situation. Calm down. You know, it's all, you know, super, super fast. That doesn't happen. They've done these MRI scans. It's overactive in the, in the fear hub and inactive in the limbic system, the regulation system. And so what happens is everything is intense. All emotions are intense. And so a lot of borderline people, and I, and I recognize it in myself, are very passionate and intense people. And if it's not recognized and controlled, that's where bad, bad, bad things happen. And the other side of borderline is in the front, in the prefrontal cortex, it is underdeveloped. There's not enough um, matter there. It's, it's something happens uh, between like the ages of four and 10 in, in um, the, the childhood of these of borderlines where there is either maternal neglect or there's abuse or there is a, a trauma. And I had a trauma at three. I was sexually abused at three years old by my babysitter. And all through my, my life, my between you know being born and 10, my mother had mental illness but was undiagnosed. And so I, I watched my mom scream at my dad like constantly and my dad, He's not perfect, but he didn't do the things that he was accused of. And so I was, and my mom was also very depressed. We didn't know it was depression, of course, but she would stay in bed and she wouldn't dress us. My dad dressed us. And so I had these triggers. What happens is if you have these traumas and you're already predisposed to um, mental illness or borderline, um, the prefrontal cortex does not develop. And so you stay in your brain, in your prefrontal cortex, you stay like at that age, it's stunted. Mm. And that part of your brain controls judgment and decision-making. And the funny thing is when I was in high school and I would make the same stupid choices over and over again, my dad would say, Cherie, your learning curve is a straight line. <laughs> and he had no idea how true, because he didn't know at that time I had borderline. And a borderline is their learning curve is a straight line. Because in, that's the part of the brain that tells you, for instance, if I turn on the stove and that eye gets hot and I touch it, it'll burn my finger. So you know not to touch it. Because if you touch it, you burn your finger. But in a borderline brain, and this is a very simplistic um, example, yeah, you, you, it's like you do have the memory, but it doesn't come up and it doesn't control or dictate your next action. You think, I'm going to touch it. And then you burn yourself again. And so you don't learn from your mistakes. Interesting. Yeah. So you have two borderlines in a marriage. That's not going to work. Yeah, that sounds like a ticking time bomb is what that sounds like. And it exploded. And in the middle of that, Basil, November of 2013, my husband, my now husband, gets arrested and goes to jail. My, my children, I had sent my kids back to be with him so that I could figure out myself because I, I knew I needed help, you know, counseling. And I needed to work on myself. I wanted to work on my marriage. So I sent my kids back. And they weren't even they weren't even here for two weeks before my son called me at like two o'clock in the morning and said, Mom, Dad just got arrested. And so that was right in the center of my second marriage falling apart. <clears throat> so my in-laws brought the kids back. And so I'm dealing with 
going through this divorce, my kid's dad being in jail and having nothing and just having going through a serious mental breakdown. And um, I don't even know how we made it. I don't know how we survived. It just was the Lord. So eventually, you know, I got served with papers and I couldn't afford to, I couldn't afford a lawyer. I couldn't afford to fight it. I mean, it's probably entitled to a lot in, in Arkansas. The <clears throat> divorce laws are pretty fair and equal down the middle. If you, if you go to court and you fight it, you can get like half of the property. I could have gotten half the value of the house because everything is, once you get married, you, you know, it doesn't matter what you came in with. Now it's half mine, Right. but I had no interest in doing that. I was broken down completely. I was like a shell of a woman. I lost so much weight. I, I, my hair was falling out. I don't know how we made rent. I don't know how I worked. I was a waitress. I, I had quit my job at Walmart because this, this is a, just a poor decision. Um, and eventually I just couldn't do it anymore. I couldn't stand being in the same town because I still wanted to work things out with him. And he, he, it was, it's, a, I can't even explain the stuff that happened between us. It was a back and forth and we were still so attracted to each other, but it was toxic, so toxic. And so um, eventually my, my aunt, my mom's sister lives in Eastern Oklahoma in a little town. And um, we went and lived with her and just started over. I just had, I just had to have another restart. And I look back on all these moves and changes and I recognize the borderline in all of them. This, you know, path you take and then you have to have a restart and then start going down a good path and then you make this bad judgment and then you have to do a restart. You know what I mean? Like yeah. just this cycle of poor decision making, you know. So I'm <clears throat> living with my aunt. I get a really good job at this really great company and. I, I finally get us up an apartment, which is horrible. It's just stinks and it's nasty. And it's disgusting. It has roaches everywhere, but it, we lived there. It was a place. Um, my husband was in jail that whole time and I was divorced and very, very lonely and insecure because one of the things that um, my ex-husband would do to me was um, he would punish me uh, by not talking to me and not touching me. Mm. I remember talk to me for 10 days straight once and it was horrible and when he did talk to me it was a huge blowout and he got arrested and uh, at one point he didn't physically touch me for six weeks straight oh my gosh we were newlyweds and six weeks I not one hug not a touch on the hand not a kiss not a peck we had a king-size bed he slept in a sleeping bag with his dog between us under the covers. I was not allowed to touch him. I was not allowed to approach him. If I ever would tried, I, would, I always would try to be soft and just you know, try to break through that wall. He would say, stop being womanly. And he would say, ugh, that was the, that was the sound that he would make. And it, every time I hear that sound, it triggers. I just start thinking about that. So I was a broken, broken, broken woman. Um, and so I'm in, I'm in Fort Smith, Arkansas, and I've got this good job. I've got my kids. My ex-husband's in jail, and I am dating everybody and anybody who will give me the time of day. Like, I just, I loved the attention. I did. I, I dated so many guys. But what was funny is that all the guys that I would start to kind of get serious with, I didn't really get serious with very, very many, just a couple, they would always say, you are still in love with your ex-husband. <laughs> <laughs> like Chris. Because I would talk about him all the time. And I would smile. Like I would, we would talk, I would reminisce with my kids about the good times. And because I loved him so much. And he would, he would write me letters and tell me, you know, he became, he uh, rededicated his life to the Lord in, in jail. Um, you know, and he was sober. And part of me wanted to believe him so bad. And the other part was like, no, I'm not falling for this again. <laughs> I'm not going to go through that again, you know? Yeah. So, and so I resisted that whole year. Um, and he, you know, he many times talked about wanting to get back together with me. And I said, no, I one or twice, one, once or twice I said, okay. And then I would change my mind. I said, no, I can't do it. 
until the day he called me. He called me in January of 2015. He was in jail for the entire 2014. So he called me in January 2015 from his mom's number. And I answered. I said, I thought it was my mother-in-law calling. I said, hey, Dana. And she, he said, it's me. And I was like, what? <laughs> Tricked <laughs> you. Posted. Yeah, he was convicted and sentenced to um, what's called an eight do four, which is it's eight years, but you you got to do four. Yeah. Um, but what I didn't know was they get they gave him a chance to suspend that upon completion of a rehab program. Uh. And so he's like, hey, you know, we talked a little bit, and I I never once kept my kids from him. I do not agree with women or men who use their children as pawns to hurt their exes. I yeah. will never do that. Now it's one thing if he's using and he's going to parties, I got to protect my kids, but I'm not going to do that when he's, you know, my kids love their dad, no matter when they've been through a lot, but they love him and I will never keep them from him. And I would never keep them from my in-laws. You know, like I know my in-laws love them very much and, and they need that relationship. And so I said, you know what, I'm going to take a couple of days off and I'm bring Savannah down. My son was living in Denver with my parents. It was, he, he just, he needed some time away from the stuff we were going through. He, you know, needed to heal. And, you know, my, my mom and dad had a, a townhouse that, or not a townhouse, a condo with an extra room. And so they, he went to school out there and stayed with them for about six months. So I had Savannah with me and I said, I'm going to come down and bring Savannah to see you. because She needs to see your daddy. And so I bring him, I bring her down and I, I get out of the car and I see him walk out and, Oh, my heart just jumped into my throat and I, I, I just couldn't say no. And as soon as he started talking, I knew that his change was real. I knew that when he said he was, um, sober and, you know, free and a Christian and loving the Lord, I knew it was real. Wow. It, it, it was just different. His, he, his demeanor was different. The way he carried himself was different and, I made a decision that day, you know, we'll get, we're going to get back together. And so we, we got to back together that day. And, um, you know, he, of course he couldn't leave the state. And so I had to go back to, um, Arkansas. And so, you know, the kids had to finish out their school and, but we, we made a decision that we were going to give it another go. So after the school year ended, you know, the summer was over, I packed up all my stuff and I moved down here to Gainesville. And we, you know, uh, started, he basically started courting me, which was really, really nice. Um, I lived with his mom and stepdad. They just lived down the road and he was at that residential treatment pr program and he graduated within nine months and he came to live with us and we just, we started talking just really, you know, we both felt pretty strongly that we needed to be remarried if we were going to live, live together. Mm -hmm. Um, and so December of 2016, he proposed, or it was Christmas Eve or Christmas day of 2016 proposed, gave me a ring and we got married six months later on our original wedding anniversary. So we wow. have been remarried. How sweet. Ooh. Yeah. Yep. That's amazing. And of course it's, been a little bit hard there's 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 a lot of things that come with being a recovered addict loving a recovered addict of course you, when I, when you say i do in that situation you know there is always a risk of relapse when i made that choice to say i do that second time i knew that there was a there's always a potential when you know there's an addict always a potential for relapse i made the decision that day i will I will be with you forever, no matter what, in sickness and health, for rich or for poor, relapse or no. I, I'm not going to leave. I, I, it's different this time. I will not divorce him again. If it ever gets to the point where he needs to hit rock bottom, you know, there may be a physical distance decision that I have to make, but I will never, I will never divorce him again. And the reason I, that that's so important to me, and I told some of my girls are going through something similar with um, a decision to divorce or not divorce because of an issue of adultery, and um, but but reversed. And I said I've told these girls I said 
I am staying not because of um, anything that my husband does to deserve me to stay. I am keeping my vow, honoring my vow because I made it to God. I'm honoring my vow to, to God. And I am not responsible for my husband's sobriety. That's not my responsibility. And I've learned that as, as a, um, someone who loves an addict and someone who cares for addicts. I am not responsible for your sobriety. That's your responsibility. I am responsible for myself, my choices, the words that I say, my actions, the way that I treat you, the way that I treat others. That's the bottom line. And that's what God has called us to do. He has not called us to change our husbands. He's called us to be ambassadors for him and be the light and, and love our husbands and pray for our husbands for, the, you know, for them to be Christ-like, for, for us to be able to submit and you know, trusting the Lord that the Lord has a plan and purpose for this man. And I'm not going to get in the way. I'm, I will not get in the way and try to fix it myself, which I still, I still am dumb enough to do, which is probably the borderline in there because I don't learn from my mistakes. <laughs> so sometimes I do try to like come up with some sentence that will convince him forever to never eat again or whatever. But for the most part, I realize that's not my job. And any time I put my hand in there and try, I'm messing up whatever needs to be done. That is between Jesus and my husband. And I made a vow to love my husband, to honor him, to submit to him, to obey him, you know, to love him. And I will. I absolutely will. Wow. Wow. I mean, that is just an incredible story of, uh, I mean, just as a woman having to go through all the things that you endured, including you know, a mental diagnosis or a personality <laughs> diagnosis. Scariest and diagnosis you can possibly get. <laughs> I'm sure. Wow. And knowing that that, I mean, the moment when you realize that that has influenced your all your decisions as well as, you know, possible future decisions, it must right. be a really, like, earth chat not maybe not earth shattering is different wrong connotation but yeah i mean that's a big deal that's a reality shaking uh diagnosis is what it is it it was very scary because i went through this period of depression with it because it's just statistically at the time what i was reading was that i had a better chance of accidentally killing myself than actually recovering wow i did 10 percent of border, but people with borderline kill themselves either accidentally or on purpose. Wow. And I have, I have four or five suicide attempts under my belt. Yeah. Uh, I will never do it again. After the look on my daughter's face the last time, I will never, ever do it again. Never. I oh just my won't. gosh. It sounds like there's enough stories to go on for three or four more episodes. <laughs> I know, every time I listen to you guys, I'm like, oh my gosh, I know exactly what she's going through. Or, <laughs> <laughs> That's so incredible. Much in yeah. Oh, yeah. wow. You know, that, that is just really incredible. And your your resolution also is very admirable. I, you know, that's not some, that's, that's not a resolution that a lot of uh, us can, can attest it's to hard. having, yeah, to yeah. having made. So, but it's a daily decision too, and the, sometimes I'm like, no, I don't like that. And then most of the time, like, <laughs> I hear the Lord's voice saying, "Sheree, you made a choice." And I'm like, oh crap. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. But it sounds like you got a great pair of kids. I'll tell you what. Oh my gosh, my kids are so amazing. I don't know how. I don't know why God gave me such great kids. I don't know how they got so great, but yeah. they are. Yeah. yeah, it sounds like they're a real uh, pillar of light through the whole thing. Yes, they are. Oh, very yes, good. they're wonderful, resilient, beautiful, intelligent children who now, do great things. So. Well, very good. Now, here's the real question: Were you ever able to get your furry friends back from the foster parents? 
Yes, I was. Yoo-hoo! My Sammy back, and I got my Joey back, and now my mother-in-law has Joey. Oh. I got two kittens during the first deployment, and I named them Joey and Chandler. <laughs> oh. friend, crazy friends. Yeah, 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 yeah. You're one of those. Yeah, but now we have, <clears throat> while we were divorced, Chris got a rescue animal named Talia. Mm-hmm. I had we I had rescued Sammy, of course, or I don't know rescue is the right word. She, the, there was a wife of a deployed soldier couldn't take her with him so yeah. i took her and and then um we have when we moved here into this house we got we started renting this house where now there was this little beagle that was running around the neighborhood just barking at everybody and chasing cars and nipping and it's like whose dog is that and i talked to the hoa president she said i think that's it's a renter who left it and this oh, wow. dog was obviously abused i mean he was awful and so over three months i just would put food out and he would get closer and closer and closer until i remember the day so vividly he jumped in my arms and <laughs> kissed me and stuff and about a week later my son comes out of the bathroom and he says mom there's a beagle at the top of the steps <laughs> 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 he had gotten into our house and he has lived here ever since you know, about a year and a half oh that's a, what a great story good old beagle found a place to live Mr. Big Boy. So yeah, and then <laughs> we've got um, this girl that the young lady that I was I was her volleyball coach back in uh, ninety nine and two thousand. She uh, she lives with us now. We had to. She was in a domestic violence situation in December, and so uh, I drove out and said, "You're going to come live in Georgia if you want to." We got an apartment in the basement, so she lives with us, and she brought this beautiful fluffy cat named Snickers. So Ooh. old grumpy old man. <laughs> And then we had Barry. Now I had some bad news. Yeah. I, I had Barry, who I'd posted a picture on um, your Joyce Beresy Patreon. Barry has been missing for over two weeks now. Oh, no. um, and my my daughter is was is very distraught. But two days after he went missing, Lynn found teeny tiny little kittens, like <laughs> three or four weeks old, in the in the. Um, curb and the side of the curb is a really rainy day oh my god and they were just abandoned there there was no mom there was no other ones she brought them home she goes i'm so sorry but i couldn't leave them and i was like oh my goodness <laughs> oh the my funny god. thing is they look just like barry oh they, really well <laughs> savannah i said because barry's named after the flash that's uh-huh, my favorite yeah. I said, savannah barry ran so fast that he split into two kittens and now <laughs> So, That's adorable. So, so I totally lost count as to how many animals you got running around there. So many animals. <laughs> My husband, like, he's always like, "Please stop bringing animals into the house." Like, oh, I can't help it. I love. At one point, we had a nest with birds and babies in here, and I just love animals so much. I would take them all in if I could. Wow. Every cat, dog, I just love them. That I is love so them. funny. I love women I uh, with you know issues and pain and broken women and I love their children and I have so much love in my heart it's sometimes overwhelming yeah, well it yeah. shows you got a lot of, you got a outlet a lot of outlets to send that love it looks like yeah That's I do awesome. I do and it's great God's really blessed us so we have three dogs and three cats now right now at this moment at this exact <laughs> is that counting the cats of your of your guests Yes, okay. it's not counting the cat that's missing. Okay. If we count the cat that's missing, we have four cats. Well, and... it'll be soon to be four then. We'll, I hope we'll just so. speak that out. Yeah, I really hope so. That would really heal Savannah. She would she would just be so overwhelmed with joy. But yeah. anyway, yep. So those are my furry friends. Well, yeah, that's that's amazing. I mean, this has just been a fantastic time, you know, and. Uh, Man, you know, I've been trying to kind of uh, figure out a, uh, a a a new way to bring in the ending conversations. I think I did mm-hmm. pretty good with the furry friends one, but I have, landing the plane. Yeah, yeah, but I have no good segue into uh, into juicing on this one. Just just for a heads up for you, we're at two hours and twenty minutes. Which yeah. is great. I know. It goes by I so fast. It goes by so <laughs> fast, doesn't it? 
<laughs> it really does. I've noticed that with the other guests. Like, I'll see the timestamp on the video. I'm like, oh, yes, this is a good long one. <laughs> and I will listen to the whole thing. I love it when they're long. Add a girl. Add a girl. But before we started winding things down, I was going to give you a chance. If there was something that's burning on your heart that you wanted to talk about, we better get on it. Yeah. Yeah, that that brings me to June of 2017 when I uh, found this job somehow. Only God somehow dropped this job in my lap. Mm -hmm. And um, it's it's for a – I can't, for for HIPAA and legal reasons, say the name of the place. But um, it is one of the women's treatment and recovery service um, or support facilities in, in the state of Georgia. And, um, it's just a, it's the lowest position on the totem pole, but it is the one position that you are with the girls all the time. Um, and you just, you have these, these women who are either coming out of jail or they have a defects case where their children have been taken away or threatened to take away or, or they, um, some of our girls, um, are the priority goes to IV heroin users and IV meth users and pregnant, especially pregnant women who were IV users. And so we have, you know, women who are pregnant and have been using during their pregnancy that come in at like 20 weeks. We have a woman that, you know, no children, but she's an, a serious, severe IV user. And, um, you know, women who are coming in out of jail and they, they have, it's mandated like my husband's was. And there's some women that are just said, I can't do this anymore. I need help. Mm. And they come in and I love, oh, so it's just supernatural because it's just not natural. Yeah. You just walk in, you meet the, a new girl and you just love them. I, I just feel this overwhelming love and care for these women, I want to serve them. I want to help them. I want to teach them. And I want to tell them about who Jesus is. And I have seen so many hearts and lives changed. They bring me so much joy. And I'm not supposed to be there for selfish reasons to, get, you know, satisfy some need for joy. Right. And I'm not. I, I can't go to work and not come away with something joyful. Wow. Even That's amazing. That day. Even on a bad day when a girl makes a really dumb choice or poor decision and gets herself kicked out, those are hard, hard days, especially when there's babies involved and you've been with this baby since before they were born and you have to say goodbye and you know you're never going to see them again. Those are hard days. But I still come away with something joyful. Cause it it God, seems it's like open. one of the most rewarding sounding situations that I've even ever heard of. It's amazing. Pays terrible. No better. <laughs> but I, I would, whenever I've thought about quitting and getting a different job and pays more, I have literal, <laughs> literal <laughs> panic attacks. <laughs> there you are again. Panic attacks. Really? I cannot. I can't leave them. There's just something I'm supposed to be there. This is the work I am called to do. My dad was called in 1979 to go and educate the homeless and at-risk youth of Denver and beyond. That was his mission. That was his purpose. That was what he was supposed to do. And all these years, I'm 39 now, all these years I've been trying to figure out how can I live up to that? If you are, if your dad is Alexander the Great, (laughs) what the heck are you supposed to do? You know, (laughs) he's already conquered the known world. You know, just like, man, I can't live up to that. And that's, that's what was heavy on me for years. How am I going to live up to that? And once I finally said, hey, I don't, I don't have to do That's not my job. I want to be where God wants me to be. And once I am, it, it's not comparing whether I did more or better or saved more people or whatever. It's I will, in that, I will continue my father's legacy and my mother's legacy by constantly sacrificing my time and my energy, you know, loving these broken people to the point of sacrificial intervention, sacrificial um, inconvenience, inconveniencing myself to reach these girls. That's what's important. And I am where, I'm exactly where God wants me. And I, 
even on those bad days, I know I am supposed to be here. Wow. Yeah. I mean, that sounds like one of the most, I mean, the, the job itself sounds rewarding in a, in a lot of, um, you know, uh, well, a lot of reward for, for doing that as far as, um, you know, the, the babies, the inner, babies are the best part. The inner self, you get to hug a lot of babies, hug babies <laughs> oh, are so nice. Many I love the babies. My favorite part is in babies, yeah. But it, uh, <laughs> but but you know, it's it just sounds like one of those powerful moments where that a lot of people don't get to experience when you are doing something that you know really matters. You know, yeah. And that's not to put down what other people are doing, but you know, to be able to go into work and know that it's you know, making a huge difference. That's awesome. So, so you have my, you have my applause girl. Oh, thanks. I know that. I, mean, I don't need, but well, it's cool. Well, come on now. <laughs> You're Basil Rosewater. <laughs> what do you think? You're friends with Josh Peck. Yeah. You know, watch got, out. He was on Nickelodeon. You know, well, yeah, no, you know, gone. I was like, I was trying to tell my kids how cool this was going to be. I was like, guys, I'm going to be talking to Basil. Do you know who Basil is? No, Mom, whatever. I'm like, he and Gons have this show. And Gons made these two videos, and it's called Age of Deceit 1 and 2, and he's working on 3. And so it's the most amazing. And my my daughter is just like, I'm doing homework. <laughs> like, I can't share my excitement with anybody. <laughs> well, I'm sure there's... I just talk about Nephilim all day. <laughs> Nobody else knows what that means. <laughs> You're in a safe place. We understand you here. Oh, Oops, I married a Nephilim. <laughs> oh, yeah. I just said that. And people just look at me like, I don't know what that means. <laughs> Dang one, it! One of these days, baby, I'm gonna get that show greenlit, and I'm gonna be a star. Yes, yes. Going to I Hollywood. I want to be in it. You have me so fantastic. <laughs> I married an Evelyn. I mean, I, it, at this point, with what's going on in Hollywood, I probably could get it greenlit, but they would totally spin it to where the Nephilim's the good guy. Oh yeah, I yeah. remember an episode where we we had that chat about Nephilim being the good guys. That was an interesting and uncomfortable conversation. Yeah. I mean, I wasn't involved in it, but I listened to it so I could feel the, like, what? <laughs> yep, yep. There's a lot of question marks over what? over that whole situation. Well, yeah. Cherie, this has just been so fantastic, and I hate mm-hmm. I hate to cut it off. It's I, we have to, but we have to. <laughs> it's it's like three o'clock in the morning where you're at. Yeah, I have to stay up anyway because I have third shift the next couple of days. So I have you know, to. you kept saying third shift. I have no idea what that means, but I'm happy to have helped. <laughs> it's I'm the a pod- middle of the night shift. I'm a podcaster. I have no reference for what a shift of a job even uh, is. Third shift is an overnight shift. It's like the graveyard shift. Oh, well, so that's... it starts at 11:30 p.m. and goes to 7:30 a.m. and I don't so, mind it. So it actually sounds but, a lot like podcasting now that I think about yes. it. That's when I listen to the most canary cry. That's between the hours of 11 p.m. and 7.30 a.m. is bad so one you, gone all night long. So yeah. you're that one we see downloading in the middle of the night. Okay, <laughs> yes. that makes sense. I'm the one when you get the email that says, Shri Hot has, has <laughs> put a comment on this video that you aired like go, years ago. Or go something. to sleep, Shri. <laughs> It's 2.30 in the morning. That's yeah, fun. Uh, I'm like, I love this guy. This is so amazing. Whatever, you know, like, okay. I don't know why I can't. Anyway, well, go ahead. Well, no, well, so <laughs> in lieu of um, unless you've got some great juicing story you want to tell me. I will, oh, yeah. I really you, do. You do. Okay, sure. give it to me. Make my job sure. easy, baby. Gosh. <laughs> well, my ex-husband and I got into fitness like crazy we were doing p90x and oh, yeah. like, just eating healthy and i loved it and we were like we need to juice so we <laughs> saved up some money and we went and shopped around and we found this oh exquisite juicer <laughs> and he was so like he did not really treat my children very kindly mm-hmm. and he he my daughter is clumsy and a little bit klutzy and not graceful and so he was like warning her from the beginning like do not touch this you don't want you to break it you're gonna put something in the first time he used it he threw in some cherries oh newbie (laughs) mistake 
Uh, he was so concerned with Savannah messing it up, and he just first time threw those cherries and those pits just <laughs> rah, you know, totally messed up the blades. It was so wonderful <laughs> for Savannah. <laughs> I was like, yeah. Just instant, but, yeah, we used uh, to <laughs> instant it was retribution. Good. Oh yeah, absolutely. It was wonderful. It was a hor- horrible feeling and awful and wonderful feeling at the same time. That's but so no, funny. after that, we we juiced for quite a while. He kept it in the divorce, of course. I paid uh, for classic. It, but he bought me these um, uh, cooking knives. I cooked a lot, and he bought me these knives for Mother's Day. And he did wouldn't give them to me in the divorce. Like I said, those are my knives. He said. <laughs> You'll have to fight for him for him in the divorce. Oh, I was like, oh you God. gave this to me for Mother's Day. Brutal. Brutal. Very expensive times. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And and he kept the fridge. My sister bought us a brand new fridge and for our wedding and he kept that and kept the house that we bought together oh my and gosh. kept the what, juicer. What did you even get out of that deal? Nothing. Nothing. Shame. The cats. Freedom. The cats no. and freedom, huh? I got freedom. Oh, yeah. I got freedom to go be with the man that my God had had created for me. Worth it. I got absolutely worth it. Worth it. There's more juicers. Yeah, I'll get another juicer. <laughs> Once I have some money, we just put that on the prayer list. Yeah. Lord, it's a juicer. There you go. The It'll Lord come. shall provide. Oh, He will. Well, yeah, Mama Cherie, working. as I've uh, been referring to you in my head for about three weeks now. Thank you so much for coming on the show. This was so fantastic and definitely a story that's going to not only as relatable to a lot of people who need to relate to someone, um, but just endlessly touching. So I appreciate it so much making the time to come on the show. Thank you. You're so thank you. You're so welcome. Make sure to give a little kiss on the heads of each of those kitties and a little pat. And here's a kitty. There's a kitty right here. Say hi, Monty. Hello, kitty. Say, hi, Monty. How are you doing? She's very mic shy. She's very loud until I put her up to the mic, and then she knows. She knows I'm recording her. So cute. Yeah. Yeah, she's a grumpy little girl. But there you go. So, again, so very grateful. And, um, you know, this is the ow, this is the time that I, you know, give people a chance to plug things. But it sounds like you are legally restricted from... Plug well, I do want oh. I do want to plug something. Okay, Not my it. job. Okay, I, I am legally restricted to mentioning where I work, but mm-hmm. I do want to plug my dad, my dad's ministry. Oh, do my it. dad works so hard. He is in his sixties, and that man will fundraise until the day he dies. He will. He will. It's. He, we've almost lost him twice, um, and uh, it doesn't matter. Nothing keeps that man down. Uh, you, you can learn more about the Denver Street School at denverstreetschool.org. Um, a few years ago after he, he suffered a stroke and when he woke up, the Lord led him to, um, um, taking in and educating the rescued women of the human trafficking industry. Mm. Denver is the number two worst city for human trafficking and Atlanta is number one. And he now has a school called Hope Academy in Denver. It is one of the Denver street schools. Um, he also, um, the, the other ministry that he has, it's above that. It's like an umbrella ministry called the street school network.org. Um, that is where you know, people from around the United States and the world can come and learn. They get tools and, and all this other kind of stuff, um, to help them to set up a school and, um, you know, kind of just, Glean uh, the the original school, which by the way I graduated from in 1997. Hey, Go Bulldogs! Congrats! Uh, <laughs> yeah, um, that's the model school. It's like the the uh, what do you call that? The um, ship, the, the pi- um, pilot project yeah, or yeah. something. Yeah. yeah, yeah, pilot ship, whatever. So they model they model the schools after that. Oh, the flagship. Flagship. Thank yes. you. I never would have thought. Of I thought you were just saying ship as like a cute Christian way to curse. Yeah, no, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Christian cussing. <laughs> I used to get in so much trouble for Christian cussing, like you know the Bolshevik Revolution. I yeah, mean, I yeah. Mean, there's Bolshevik gl- in a Christians. Way and... There's no greater creativity than Christians trying to curse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. Flagship, <laughs> as in you know, the ship that holds the flag. Yeah. 
Yeah. So anyway, denverstreetschool.org and streetschoolnetwork.org. They can learn more about the school and how they can help or either donate or if they're in, an, in the area of one of the schools on the Street School Network website, um, they can find out how to help one of those local schools. Or if they're in Denver, they can find out how to contribute to either the East or West Campus of the Denver Street School or um, Hope Academy, uh, which is in a private, secure location for obvious reasons yeah so. for sure well definitely mm-hmm. and make sure to send me those links after we're sure. done and i will put them in the show notes and people get involved support those ministries as much as you can um, with your time or your resources whatever you got because uh that's some real good stuff that's been going on for a long time and needs yeah. to keep going on because that's the real deal baby mm-hmm. uh sheree Thank you so much for coming on the show. Just truly, truly blessed to hear your story tonight. Thank you for having me, Basil. I appreciate it. I you really do. You betcha. And we're going to talk again soon. Yay! Okay, say <laughs> bye to everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye. Well, there you go, folks. I was real hyped at the beginning of this one, and I got to say, promise delivered. You're welcome. I hope you enjoyed that because I certainly did. And hey, while you're thinking about it, everybody, while you got your phone in your hand, hopefully not while you're driving uh, or if you're sitting at your computer, wherever you are, why don't you open it up, open up a browser and head to streetschoolnetwork.org or denverstreetschool.org. Get involved. See what's going on over there. Learn more about the program. Share the program with all your friends. Send your resources. Send your prayers. Really, what a wonderful program going on. And, uh, you know, the more people we can get involved with that, the better. It's doing the real good work. The real good work. That's right. Well, also, you know what else is doing the real good work? Head over to Patreon.com. Slash the Joyce Piracy Theory. Wow, the most shameless plug for a Patreon account ever. Well, anyways, it's over there if you guys are interested. I'm going to be putting out more bonus episodes. There's hours and hours of more stuff to go listen to over there. Um, You can also get some shout-outs on the show. You can get messages read on the show. But, uh, you know, one thing people pretty hyped about Ask Baz. It's a little show I've been doing where people send me their questions about faith or life or love or Basil, myself. And uh, I get on there and I answer them to the best of my ability. And I have a real good time doing it. And um, you guys seem to be liking that. So I'm going to keep putting them out there. Okay? So if you guys are interested in that, head over to patreon.com slash the joy spiracy theory. But, you know, you should probably check out denverstreetschool.org first. Give give most of your attention to that. And then after that, you can head to Patreon. Anyways, on top of that, you can go over to iTunes or Stitcher or Podbean or whatever and leave a rating and a review. Super important. Gets the robots to share the show around. And, uh, yeah, rating is one to five stars. And uh, a review is just a bunch of words explaining why you chose the stars that you did. And, hey, if you want to come on the show, I got space for more people to come on the show. Go ahead and email tjtguests at gmail.com. We'll get you on the schedule. And that's right. So, everybody, go do that and be good, y'all. Bye.